Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is another wonderful, glorious day here on Lagos University Sabbath School, where we have an in-depth, exhilarating study of the Word of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is wonderful to be back here with you one more time. I've been on, I've been off, been doing a lot of different things here on the church campus. And then last week, I got a chance to take a trip off the island. Oh my gosh, it was such a wonderful, wonderful experience. But I missed you all, I sure did. But I am glad to be back here one more time on Lagos University Sabbath School. We are excited today. We have a lot going on here at the Hamilton Church today. It is our community guest day here today. And we are excited that family and friends from across the island and even yay from overseas have come to share and worship with us today. And I have a treat for you. Yeah, I do. We have a guest panelist and I cannot wait for you to get an opportunity to meet him. So before we do that, I want you to do something for me. That's right. Press like, share, and subscribe because you help to continue to be in partnership with us to get the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world because there are still people in the world who do not know Jesus Christ, who do not know the gospel, the good news, and all that Jesus can do for them. And so he said that the gospel will go out around the world and then he will come. So if we're looking for Jesus to come, then let's help to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out around the world. So press that like, share, and subscribe. And if you are not in a position to do that, yep, you know what you can do. You can pick up your trusty telephone and you can make a call. Call a friend, call a family member, call mom, call cousins, call all of them and tell them to join Lagos University Sabbath School, whether on our live stream, our Facebook, our YouTube, and our ATV. See, we are going around the world and you help us to do that. And now we will go right into our song service and we will be blessed in ministry by Deacon Michael Spencer and Sister Simone Otterbridge. Sing with us. Lift your voices loud. Let them ring. Who's coming? Jesus is coming again. Sister Simone, Brother Spencer, take us to heaven. Good morning, happy Sabbath. The song says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Yeah. 
says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. We're just coming right out of the Bible today. Amen. <laughs> of the Lord forever I will sing I will sing I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing of the mercies of the Lord and with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness thy faithfulness and with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations I will sing of the greatness of the Lord forever I will sing I will sing I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. And with my mouth will I make known I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I sing of the mercies of the Lord. Amen, amen, Brother Michael and Sister Otterbridge. What a wonderful, glorious song service we just had. Did you join in and sing? I sure do hope so. Are you singing of God's mercies forever? What is it that God has been gracious to you in? Oh, this week he has given us life. He has given us health. He has given us strength. He has been a wonderful God to us, even in our trials, even in our struggles. We realize that they are, were not as bad as they could have been, and that is because of God's mercies. So I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. And that's all I'm going to do right there. I'm not, I'm not going to sing, sing, but I'm going to do that right there. Stop it right there. <laughs> well, we are going to go into our lesson study for this week. And it is called lesson nine. And it is called a city called confusion, a city called confusion. Now, we know if there's a city that is called confusion, we know it does not belong to the kingdom of who? Of God. We know that the city of confusion does not belong to the kingdom of God. So it belongs to who? We'll find out. And we'll find out exactly why it is not God's kingdom and what we can do about making sure that we are not finding ourselves in the city of confusion. Well, we are going to go right into meeting our panel for this morning. I told you we have a special guest. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. But I want you to, um, Dr. Bree, good morning. How are you this morning? Dr. Brianna Thornton, it is good to see you this morning. How are you doing? Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. A beautiful morning. The sun's shining a little bit, even though we've had a week of constant rain, it seems. But... 
blessed to be here and thoroughly enjoyed running the half marathon yesterday. That was the first time for me, and so that was great. Definitely a high Sabbath. Amen, amen, amen. That's right, Dr. Bree has alluded to the fact that we have been under some rainy weather here in Bermuda from about Monday. Yes, folks, because I flew back in oh. on Monday. And so from Monday onwards, the only day that... Um, had some shining sun was Thursday. It was Thursday and it was my brother's birthday and sometimes he gets an opportunity to watch. So happy belated uh, birthday brother, Gareth Jody Bean. Um, so I'll get that plug in there. Maybe he's watching today. Um, but we had some April showers, because mm -hmm. usually April mm -hmm. showers bring the May flowers, but we got the rain in May. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, in the next few days, we'll see some flowers budding. Maybe. And June um, will be flourishing with greenery and beautiful colors of flowers around. But Dr. Bree, you ran the half marathon. How was that? I mean, that what is... <laughs> <laughs> It was so great. Anna Marcus over her accident, what did she come? I, I just wanted to, she finished the race. <laughs> <laughs> I finished it, right? The race isn't to the strong or the mighty, but those who finish, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amen. So you finished the race and you finished strong. And that's how we do it, folks. We start and we finish strong all in between. We may have to, you know, climb up and run down, mm. but and we may even have to walk sometimes. Mm. But Hey, we finished strong each time. So, Dr. Bree, congratulations Thank for you. finishing the half marathon. Thank you. For starting it and finishing That's right. it. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So, good to see you here this morning. And the fact that you're here, you know, bright and smiling and just kind of ready to go. Ready I mean, to go hey, you, you killed that. <laughs> there you go. Out of Mark, you're here in the middle. It is good to see you in your space this morning. Happy How are you doing today? Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's happy good Sabbath. to be in the house of the Lord and happy belated. Uh, Bermuda Day. Yes. Um, hope you all have a good Sabbath. Amen. Amen. And so you're ready for a city call confusion? I'm ready. You're ready? All right. I'm we'll ready. see how this takes us. And so I've got two <coughs> minutes. I'm going to spend that time talking to our special guest this morning. Our guest panel is here on Lagos University Sabbath School. Good morning, Dr. Daniel, now I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try the last name because you're <laughs> going to help us with that and we're going to because we want to make sure that we get that right. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to be somebody else's Daniel something to be like, well, I thought I saw him sitting in the pew next to me on Sabbath. We want to make sure that we get the right Daniel who's sitting here with us on Lagos University. So good morning, Dr. Daniel. It is good to see you. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, but you're going to give me your name and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Hi. Go ahead. Well, my name is Dr. Daniel Newbrander. That's the way I say it. Keep okay. it simple, I say. Yes. So. Great. Yes. Great. Well, it is wonderful to see you here. And there's a, a reason why you're, you're, you're here with us this morning. As I mean, you know, we always love to have special guests here on Lagos. Mm -hmm. But there's a real special reason that you are here today. And um, tell us what that reason might be. Well, I am here actually visiting my girlfriend, Dr. Brianna Thornton. Hey, hey so, people, yeah. do you see that? Hey, there you go. Dr. Bree has got an extra smile. I mean, she smiles all the time. She's got an extra glow and a smile today. So we want to say welcome to Lagos University Sabbath School. We want to thank you for coming and visiting Dr. Bree and uh, being here as a panelist for, for us today. So you did something yesterday as well. Um, on Yeah, you, yes. yesterday as well. Yes, I, I did. I got to, I have felt very welcomed here because I got to be welcomed by Brianna and I've been welcomed by the Bermudian community. Amen. And I got to participate in the, the Bermuda ha Day Half Marathon as well. So it's been a wonderful experience. And, you know, it's amazing to see, you know, for 13 miles, just people lining the roads, just out cheering you on, you know, saying, say they don't know my name because they don't know who I am, but they calling out my, my, uh, <laughs> race number and you know just cheering me on just big smiles for 13 miles it's just it's been an amazing experience so amen 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 so i am so glad that you felt welcomed by dr brie and and rightfully so mm -hmm. but i am so glad that the bermudian community showed up as we always do to yes. welcome yes. our visitors to the island and you are now family Okay. Yes, I feel like it. Great. I'm glad you do. So tell us a little bit about yourself before we go into our lesson study for today. Sure. So I grew up in eastern Tennessee. That's that's home to me. And I, I live and work currently in, in southwest Virginia, so not too far away from home. I'm a, I'm a physical therapist, or I guess more in the British system, but a physiotherapist. So 
Um, and I graduated in 2019, so I've been out working for about three years, just enjoying seeing a lot of patients and being able to make an impact and, and you know, meet people where they are and, and meet their needs as well. So it's been a wonderful experience, a uh, little trying sometimes at times, but it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to serve people and others in the community as well. So that's what I do, and that's part of a lot of who I am, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where the future takes me, and I'm very excited to be here right now. So. Amen, amen, amen. Wonderful. Now, I, I did a read a little bit in your bio that you um, have been a lifelong seven-day Adventist. Yes. And and that means a lot. Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah. yeah. It's it's something that's a big part of, also a big part of who I am, and it's something that, you know, is is important, especially for, for young people, because, you know, in, in recent years, we've seen kind of an exodus from the church of mm -hmm. young people. So it's something that I'm passionate about, and... Uh, we all have our struggles, right? But as we keep a close relationship with Christ, we're able to see him uh, lead us through those hard times too. Amen, amen, amen. So I thank you for that. We've gotten to know a little bit more about Dr. Daniel. And um, I see that you enjoy volleyball and you enjoy being in nature and you've got mm. nature all around yes. here. And you said you enjoy running, and you got to show us a bit of that yes. yesterday and enjoy uh, seeing the, the island from a different vantage point. Yes. So I'm glad that the people of Bermuda showed you a lot of love. Yes. <laughs> well, folks, we are going to go right into our lesson study discussion for this morning. And our abled moderator in the person of Elder Howard Eben is right on the wings, ready to come on and take us into our lesson study discussion for this morning. So in the chat, I want you to show Dr. Daniel a lot of love. <laughs> Please welcome him right there on the chat from around the world, and we'll be able to share it with him when we conclude today's lesson study. And our opening prayer is being brought to us by Dr. Brianna Thornton. And then the next voice you will hear is that of our most abled moderator, Elder Howard Eben. Enjoy the lesson study discussion for today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for uh, your love, for your grace, for your power, for how wonderful you are. Please send the Spirit to guide each of us as we present, each listener and viewer who's studying along with us. Guide us each into truth. Speak to each of our hearts and personalize this message for each one of us today. We ask in Jesus' name, <coughs> amen. amen. And good morning, Sabbath School. Good morning, good morning, Elder Howard. Good morning, good morning. Uh, blessings to each and every one of you out there uh, in Cyberland and all around the world and here in Bermuda, uh, from Canada to Jamaica, uh, to England, to Africa. Uh, we welcome you to Logos University. We're going to get uh, started, but I, I just couldn't help it. I, Dr. Brianna uh, sharing that she ran the marathon <laughs> and she had, you know, shared her boyfriend was here with her. That's what she had texted me and, and I thought when she said she ran the marathon, she was running from him. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but come to find out he ran with her. So amen, everyone. So that means all cards are off the table. If you thought she was eligible, uh, that has changed. He ran with her, and I don't think it was by accident. I don't think it was by accident. So uh, glad to have you here, Dr. Uh, Daniel. We'll have fun with you as we go through it. You are so nervous right now. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> but today we want to get right into 
the lesson, a city called confusion. City called confusion. Uh, th this is a very delicate lesson, everyone, and I know that you have been studying all week. And, you know, sometimes when uh, families have discussions, sometimes we have to share things that come out uh, in a way that we don't really want to hear or it rubs against our grain. And we're praying today as we share these wonderful truths from the Word of God that you will receive the Word as we have sought to present this wonderful Word. We seek to present it in love. We uh, seek to present it as the way that Jesus would. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and sometimes we think we know it all and we, we don't know everything. So we are all hypocrites here. We are all hypocrites here on Lagos University. I know they didn't say amen, but I'll say amen. Uh, we all mess up at times, but it's because of the grace of God. So we don't always get it right. And, and, and so if sometimes uh, it may come across as, as, as uh, we are acting as if we know everything, no, that's not our desire. Our desire is to move into a way that you receive this gospel in the, in, in the love that God would have it, not pointing fingers, but to, sh and, I, and I put a disclaimer out there now, that it, it, if it comes across wrong, it would not come across wrong from me. Uh, maybe, uh, but it would not come across from me. <laughs> a -a -a Amen. And so we're putting a disclaimer uh, <laughs> out, out, out there that we're going to present this uh, in love. Amen, panel? Amen. So good morning to you, panel. Blessed Sabbath. To you. We, wanted to, we wanted to clear that up, right? Because truths sometimes can, sometimes people can come across real hard with truths. It comes across in the wrong way. Well, you know what? It was quite interesting. January 6th in the United States, the Capitol was attacked. January 6th, 2021, the Capitol was attacked um, by some rioters who were supporting U.S. President Donald Trump. You know, in 2020, he lost uh, his presidential election. But um, we find that uh, supporters attacked the United States Capitol. And as they attacked the Capitol, there was a man by the name uh, of Stuart Rhodes, who was the founder of the Oak Keepers. You have the Oak Keepers, you have the Proud Boys, you have different militias that were supporting, and others supported the president, felt that he should be the president of the United States. And at the end of the day, you, you don't attack a government. You, if you're going to attack a government, you better come with every machinery possible. You cannot overthrow the United States government. They sought to overthrow the United States government. Capitol Police lost their lives. Many of people uh, were injured and hurt. And then Stuart Rhodes uh, was uh, uh, sentenced to 18 years in jail. Satan, 18 years in jail, and this is what the judge said, says, I have never have said to anyone that I have sentenced, you pose an ongoing threat and peril to our democracy and fabric of this country. This is what the judge says, you are a threat to our country, so we're going to incarcerate you. It is quite interesting that everyone that follows Donald Trump, well, listen, let me say it this way. You, you, when you go the wrong way, you're going to have issues. You're going to have issues. But if you follow the word of God and the truth of God's word, the Bible says, and the truth will set you free. I'm reminded of a story in the Bible that says that uh, Lucifer, when he was in heaven, the Bible says that there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the, the dragon and his angels, and the dragon and his angels prevailed not, and they were cast to the earth. Lucifer sought to take the capital, to take God's capital, to take God's throne. And the Bible says that he and his followers prevailed not. And God, at the end of the Bible, says that you are a threat to our democracy. You are a threat to civilization. We're going to throw you and those with you into the lake of fire. And so it reminds me why now we have this lesson study that we're going to go into. Because what we have is a judge who has said to Satan, you are a threat to our democracy, to liberty of conscience, to freedom, and to worship God in love. 
And so we find in our first slide, we find that the judge on the throne says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, next slide, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And it's quite interesting that the hour of his judgment means that God has given man an opportunity. That word judgment means that God has given man the earth dwellers. You remember those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Given the earth dwellers an opportunity to move away from the beastly ideology and philosophy, the Babylonian ideology and philosophy, move from that theology into worshiping the creator of the heavens and the earth. Meaning that in this word judgment, God has given man a chance. Grace can move man into a direction into worshiping God. And so here we have it now. We have those individuals, will be individuals in Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 says, and here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ or have the faith of Jesus Christ. And so now we are in Sunday's lesson. We find out that we have faithful individuals that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, but they are being persecuted. They are being persecuted by government rulers. They are being persecuted by the church. And it's not their church that they're being persecuted by. And so therefore, we go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and it says this here, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These will make, Revelation 17, 14 says, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords, King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. What is the Bible here? Uh, here trying to depict the question is, how is God's church described, and what is Satan's reaction to it? Well, the church, as I shared, is being persecuted by an apostate religion. So let's go to it. The next slide, please. And stay with me as we go through each slide. The next slide. As we go, we find out in Revelation chapter 14, we first have the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And then we have Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. We have now another message, a second angel's message. And that message says, and another angel follows, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So, so we have to discover, well, who is this church that is in opposition with God's kingdom and also in opposition to the point that they persecute God's people? So we have the first angel's message, and then we have the second angel's message. And this, this kingdom is called Babylon. Why is it called Babylon? Because in the Bible, you have what is called ancient Babylon, and then we have eschatological Babylon, Martin-day Babylon, which we have in this day and age, where we will hear more from the panel as they share. But it's quite interesting. It says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What does it mean that it is fallen? What it means is Babylon is now under judgment, and they will be sentenced for the, for the crime that they, they have committed. For the word fallen means that they are under condemnation. Are you with me? That's what the word fallen means. It means that they are under condemnation. So when we say to people Babylon is fallen, what we mean they are under condemnation. Remember Romans chapter 8, verse 1, praise the Lord, says there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but they walk according to the Spirit. So if you're walking in favor with God, the investigative judgment is to refine you into his image. If you are walking out of favor with God, you are under now condemnation. If you remember in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, we said that, uh, verse uh, 6 and 7, we said that the judgment would give man an opportunity through the grace of God. But in Revelation chapter 14, 8, 
Fall and fall in Babylon means that they're under condemnation and they will be sentenced. There is no second chance. There is no opportunity because the word fallen also means is that this organization, uh, this, this church body that works in harmony with the beast has given its will over as a slave to the dragon who gave power to the beast and gave great authority. Are you with me, Elder Mark? And so because they have given their will as a slave over to the enemy, they have committed the unpardonable sin, and there is no turning back for them. So therefore, the, the, set, the, the, the verdict has gone forth. The sentence is that they'll be burned in the lake of fire. But God now wants his people to be able to see why he has made the decision. Come on now. He's a judge of the earth to cast Babylon into the lake of fire. And so let's go on to the next slide as I have a couple of minutes left. The next slide says, so we ask the question. What is it about Babylon and the wine? Ezekiel 8.14 says, So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting here weeping for Tammuz. We're giving you an idea of Babylon. If you understand in, in, in the time of Daniel, Babylon, when, Daniel had, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and was asked uh, who can interpret the dream, he called in Daniel chapter 2 for his magicians. He called for his soothsayers, his astrologers. So we know the characteristics of Babylon is not just an organization that exalts itself, but it deals with mysticism. It, it deals with uh, 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 worshiping false gods and even believe, next slide, believing in the state of the dead. And so therefore, if you're worshiping Tammuz, uh, Watchman, April 1940, this is what it says. The pagan doctrine of immortality of the human soul crept into the back door of the church in the early centuries. Well, who is Tammuz that the children of Israel would find themselves worshiping? My God. Who is Tammuz that the, child, uh, the children of God would find themselves worshiping? Well, if you remember, there was a man, a mighty hunter in the book of uh, uh, Genesis chapter 9, 10, 11. He was a mighty hunter. He was the one who built Babel. That was his first city. When Tammuz died, he had a wife that was named Samaramis. Samaramis had a son that was named Tammuz. Samaramis knew in the Genesis chapter 3 story that there would be a Messiah, that a Savior would come into the world. So Samaramis wanted to keep her power and authority. She said that Nimrod had died. He went into the sun. He is now the sun god. And that her son, Tammuz, was Nimrod reborn. So now we have worshiping the dead. And so as the worshiping the dead, we have this pagan doctrine of immortality that has crept into, uh, into the church. Next slide, please. And as it's crept into the church, we have Ouija board. We have Ouija boards, and we know Ouija boards mean seances, that we talk to the dead. We communicate with the dead. But the Bible says the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Next slide. And so now we have it in our church. Not the Seventh-day Adventist church, but you can have a Ouija board that is called the Holy Spirit board, where you can communicate God. You can get it on Amazon.com, $29.99, where they are saying that you can actually talk through God, but we know that there's the spirits of devils, come on, going throughout the earth. And so we have ancient Babylon, and then we have modern teachings of Babylon, and we see them in the church. So to, next slide, please. And so we asked the question. So the Revelation 12, 9 says, so the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Next slide. And because his angels is cast out, we asked now, who is this Babylon that is fallen? Down, down, down. Next slide. And so we come in Revelation chapter 17, 1 and 2. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. We have fornication, we have corrupt wine. The inhabitants of the earth made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You're going to get more on that. Next slide. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beach, which was full of names of blasphemy. Blasphemy, going against God. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones. She's arrayed depicting her character. She's the, because we know in the Bible that stones, are jewels, are depict the character of God. And God wants to adorn his people with his character. But this church has their own identity. The identity is connected to the dragon who gave them power. Are you with me? I know we're giving you a lot, but we ain't got that much time. Next slide. That's it. The next slide. And so in Revelation uh, uh, symbols, we understand that a woman represents the church. A harlot woman is a false church. A pure woman is the true church. 
Waters and seas represent peoples and corrupt government. Kings of the earth are political leaders. Drunk is deceived, and wine is the false teachings. So we're putting that on the table of you now, because next slide. As we put this on the table, we now move into our panel. And I said all of that very quickly. They will go back to YouTube, they will rewind, and they'll discover a lot. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. But we only have a short span of time, right? The, the, the studier, praise the Lord, will want to study, and they will want to learn. Thank you, sister, for helping me out. And so now, Dr. Brianna, we go to Monday's lesson. Break it down even more, because I was just like a commercial. <laughs> huh? But God presented it. Now you take your time and you break it down, doctor. Amen. Well, that was a wonderful introduction to this week's lesson. It is power-packed, many symbols, many concepts. So we'll return straightway to that Revelation 17, 1 through 4, and read through that, because that's what we're going to unpack here on Monday's lesson. So Revelation 17, 1 through 4, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So let's apply those, those symbols that Elder Emmons just defined for us in the previous slide as we unpack these verses. So first image we have here is a woman. And as Pastor Emmons said, woman represents either a true church or a false church. We have the true tr church, excuse me, mm -hmm. described in mm -hmm. Revelation 12. And then here in Revelation 17 is one of the several descriptions we have of the false religious system. And how do we know that a woman represents um, a religious system or the church? A beautiful example of that that I really like is found in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 7. This is referring to Christ's true church, those believers who are going to um, go to heaven when Jesus comes. It says in Revelation 19, 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine Amen. linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Amen. So right there, there are many important points there describing God's people. They have put on Christ's robe of righteousness and accepted his righteousness that is clean and bright and fine linen that only he can provide us. And it is beautifully portrayed um, as the marriage between Christ and his church. A beautiful portrayal there. But now in contrast to this, we have a false religious system that isn't accepting God's provision, God's word, Christ's robe of righteousness, Christ's atonement, all those kinds of things. It's not accepting that and instead trying to do it their own way and is accepting deceptions ultimately which come from the devil. And that's what we're reading about here in Revelation 17. So we have the woman, the false religious system of beliefs, and then she's riding a beast. And again, as Elder Evans pointed out, so this beast with seven heads, ten horns, those types of symbols represent then political powers and kingdoms and stuff. So we know that what this scene is portraying here in Revelation 17 is this combination of a religious system with a political system. The way that that's combined there with the woman riding on this beast with horns and heads and so forth. So moving on in this, another key point here is that it says that she committed fornication with the kings of the earth, with all the kings of the earth. So clearly this affects like everybody, the whole world. And we know from the uh, three angels message that we've been studying in Revelation 14, that the, in the first angels message, it says that the gospel is going to go into all the world for everybody to hear this beautiful message of salvation. And of course the devil doesn't like that. So he tries to come up with his own deceptions 
to so that people won't take advantage of that opportunity and of the message of the gospel and be saved. Um, so he, through this false system, false beliefs, is trying to confuse all the inhabitants of the earth. Again, we can't say that, oh, I won't be affected. This is, you know, covers everybody. Um, going on then, what does these ter do these terms mean then? Where it says that she committed fornication with the kings of the earth and may, they were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. These mm. two symbols are the main points in Monday's lesson. So what does this mean? Well, fornication, that's an illicit relationship. Um, and often that situation, like in a brothel or something, you have multiple relationships. And it also in that verse says plural with the kings. Mm -hmm. So you've got multiple illicit relationships. Um, and so instead of staying true to Christ, as that portrayal that I read in Revelation 19. Instead of people, God's church, staying true to him, to Christ, as his bride, there are some religious systems that instead are trying to mix in human doctrines of their own devising deceptions from Satan in these illicit mixtures and relationships. And finally then, the wine. What, what does that represent? Well, wine in Bible times was often drunk because water was scarce. So again, it was a part of something that they needed to consume in their daily life. So as spiritually, what do we need to consume in our daily lives? Jesus said that we are to drink his blood, drink and eat his flesh in John, um, John 6. 53 speaks of this and even in Christ's day people were confused when he first meant when Jesus was first telling them this but of course he was speaking symbolically John 6 verse 53 then Jesus said to them most assuredly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life I will raise him up at the last day for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, and it goes on. So we are supposed to constantly, daily, be partaking of Christ and his word and his teachings and his truth and his grace and atonement and sacrifice for us. Um, and that's how we prepare ourselves to remain true to sound doctrine and not get confused by this Babylon figure that we're studying today. However, in Revelation 17, this false system also has their wine that's a deception trying to replace the wine, symbolic wine that Christ gives us of himself. Um, so this wine, this false wine in Revelation 17 is false doctrine that's trying to usurp um, God's provisions, trying to usurp God's word, trying to usurp Christ's sacrifice and forgiveness um, that he gave for us. So we have to remain grounded in God's true word so that we won't be deceived by these false doctrines and these mixed relationships of human ideas with different religious systems ideas, with different political system ideas, so we don't get confused by all that. And at the end there, in Revelation, <coughs> excuse me, in Revelation 18, there's hope. It says, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit in a cage of an unclean and hated bird, for all the nations have drunk of the wine. But... I, what I want to focus on is the beginning of that verse. It says, come out of her, my people, um, in verse 4. It says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So the hope in that verse is that God wants to call all of us out of the 
any misinterpretations we have of who he is, any false doctrines we might have grown up with, God wants to call us out of those, is calling us out of those, if we are willing to stand on his word and his word alone. He's saying, come out of her, my people, because he doesn't want us to die. He doesn't want us to perish. He wants to save us if we are just willing to stand on his word of lo alone and rely on alone on his sacrifice and his redemption for us. I, I like how you shared that, Doctor, and you broke down with it. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Because for the simple fact is the, the, the wine, uh, wine seduces. Uh, and, and, and the Bible says that the church, the false church, this corrupt church, this beastly church, uh, Elder Mark will go into it more, it says it deceived with its false doctrine and the wine such the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. That's, that's a false doctrine. Uh, uh, when you die, you go to heaven. That's a false doctrine. Uh, uh, you're, you're saved by works and not grace alone. That's a false doctrine. That's what Martin Luther fought, ag fought against. And, and there are many false doctrines that crept into the church. We shared earlier how the teaching of Tammuz, uh, uh, Samaramis holding a little baby in her arms, well, that was depicting that she was holding the Savior. And therefore, in different cultures, you will see pictorial pictures of uh, a mother holding a, a little baby. And, and that was pointing back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. But what I like how you, you have brought up, uh, uh, brought about, or brought out, excuse me, is Revelation chapter 18 says, come out so that you don't be partakers of the sins. I, I like that because the judgment has already been imposed. It's meted out. There's no turning back. God has looked at, at, at Babylon and says, there's no way that your system could ever advance my kingdom. It is, it is corrupt, and it will bring the government of God down. It's totally contrary. But the people inside Babylon, the people inside Babylon, uh, they can be saved. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and so that tells me when we look at the pictorial symbolism is, is that when you partake of wine, when you get addicted to wine, when you get addicted to drugs, when you get addicted to anything, there can be a sobering time. Hmm? There's a sobering time. Come on, panel. There's a sobering time where you say to, see, see th I I if you grew up in the church and you never had a drink, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But when you get sober in Jesus, come on now, where you put away all your drugs and your alcohol and you get sober, is the one person have a drink inside her that could say amen? When you have a period where you say, I'm tired. I don't want this anymore. That's your sobering time because this is not enriching me. This is not enhancing me. So the false wine, the false doctrine in Revelation chapter 18, the people are now open for something better. And we are living in a time where you, we are all wanting something more in our relationship with God. And this is why that message can go out, Revelation chapter 18, come out because the people are desiring more. Amen. So the beast represents a false religious system. Thank you very much. Out of Mark, we are now into Tuesday. Yes. Help us to understand Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. Mm. Come on now, Tuesday. Uh, Mystery Babylon the Great. Um, this lesson is a difficult lesson. Sometimes it's hard to uh, talk about truth because you just have to there's, it's, there's an elephant in the room, <laughs> and we keep skirting around the elephant. I asked my son, who is Babylon in the Bible? Who is Babylon in the Bible in Revelation? He didn't know. Many Seventh-day Adventists don't even know who Babylon is. We skirt around the issue. We talk about everything beside the elephant in the room. Revelation 17, verses 4 to 6 says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a gold cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And the woman, um, she was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and arrayed in purple and scarlet color, that's red. The Pope, when he goes to his um, royal functions, he uses the color purple. And his Catholics and cardinals, they wear the, the color scarlet red to show, um, to represent their function. Verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This, you notice that the mystery 
there's text messages. Whenever someone sends me an email or a text or WhatsApp message and is in capitals, I pay attention. They're either upset, something is going on, something is important. That God is screaming something out here in capitals, and he wants us to pay attention. Um, God has identified Mystery Babylon the Great. In Revelation chapter 13, the last verse, it says, um, here is wisdom, count the number of the, of the beast for his number of a, of a man, and his number is 666. Um, the, 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 the popes, they carry a title, Vicarious Freely Day, that's a Latin title, and they carry many other titles. And all these, it's strange that all these Latin titles, when you add up the Roman numerals to these, they all add up to this number 666. There's so many red flags pointing to who the mystery Babylon the Great is. Um, there's only one church that claims to be the mother church, and that's the Roman Catholic Church. The mystery, this mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth, is referring to the Roman Catholic Church, which used to be the Roman Empire, in which they, the Christians were crucified, and then became the, they changed the name to Roman Church. Uh, uh, during the Dark Ages, they, the acquisitions, they, they killed many. Many were killed because uh, on, the, on the crucifixes and burned alive as witches because they were, not, they were considered heretics. Um, and now it's talking about, well, now we're referring to the Roman Catholic Church, in which, we'll, which we know in Revelation 13 will unite with the United States and that no man might buy us out. Now, the Bible is using such, I mean, capitals. It, the Bible is using capitals, and it's, and it's talking about an evil system, and we keep skirting around this elephant in the room. Now, the Bible is calling it an evil system filled with devils. This is the Bible. This is God's word. If you could show me in the Bible where it says otherwise, then... <laughs> I will surrender my position. But you got to show me in the scriptures otherwise. And I want you to know the, this lesson. I don't know why they're putting me up here to talk about this lesson. The lesson says to be careful. And, but, I, but that's the problem. We're too careful. And in Revelation, um, Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, and they answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, this is the Babylonian king, we are, not, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. When it comes to this particular matter, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and, the, and, we, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. There are good people in the Roman Catholic Church. But God is talking about, we're talking about a system that was in the time of Jesus' day, that was in uh, during the Dark Ages, and a system that is now. There are, we're careful in that there are good people. God says, come out of her, my people. He calls, there are good people in the Roman Catholic system. But God is saying, come out of her, my people. And it's the system that is, the mystery of Babylon the Great is referring to this, to this system. Um, Revelation 17 describes an apostate religious system, and it has introduced itself into Christianity. And the lesson brings out, in order for us to understand the nature of Babylon, we need to understand the first reference in the biblical record, of, of in the biblical record found in Genesis chapter, uh, found in Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 to 9, the Tower of Babel. Um, the Tower of Babel, very of quick recap. The world wanted to build a tower to reach heaven, and they, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Uh, this was the site of the ancient Babylon. This tower of Babel was in Babylon, and they tried to reach heaven um, without God. They tried to reach heaven without God. And it's saying, um, verse 9, it says, Therefore, it is the name and the name of it is called Babel because the Lord did therefore confuse the language of the earth and the Lord did scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. 
In other words, Babylon, the Tower of Babel was no more because God um, confused their language. And as Elder Eben mentioned, it was a system, and the Tower of Babel, this ancient site of Babylon, they were self-preservation, independence. Um, they wanted to get to heaven without God, and it's the same characteristics of the spiritual Babylon that we keep beating around the bush with. Babylon, the mystery of the great. It's talking about the Roman Catholic system, which presents itself as God on earth, based on human teachings, human ideas, human traditions. Human uh, is a form of a human-made religion. And it stands in opposition to the power of the gospel and the church that Jesus built. The Tower of Babel is interesting. Do you know where th <laughs> this is? This is so mind-boggling. Do you know where the Tower of Babel was built? The Tower of Babel was built in, in southern Iraq. Today we will call it Iraq. Um, that's where Babylonia was. And it's interesting that um, in Revelation chapter 13, um, we have the, the Bible speaks about the first beast and the second beast. The first beast is the Roman Catholic Church with the system of popes. And then the second beast in Revelation chapter 13 is talking about the United States. It's interesting. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling. 20 years ago, the U.S. went to Iraq um, on the pretense of um, uh, the 9-11. 9-11, uh, they thought that, or they said that um, Iraq was responsible for it. And then they changed that view to, we're going there for weapons of mass destruction. And then they changed that, and then they said something like, oh, we're going to liberate the uh, people of Iraq. Um, this place where the Tower of Babel was in Iraq, where the beast, the second beast in Revelation, um, found in Revelation 13, goes to a place that symbolizes spiritual Babylon, which is the first beast in Revelation 13. How big does this rabbit hole go? It's, it's just... I hope you don't miss it. It's just, it's just amazing. And this Re Revelation 13, the beast in, um, the first beast and the second beast, they're going to unite so we cannot buy or sell. U.S. goes to a place in ancient Babylon, which symbolizes um, spiritual Babylon. <laughs> oh, man, it's crazy. It's crazy. This, <laughs> oh, man, it's just crazy. Uh, the failure and the United States, the the second beast in Revelation 13, they tried to rebuild Iraq after um, they rain, after bombs were rained down there and things like that. They tried to build Iraq. But this Tower of Babel will never build, be rebuilt. The remains of the Tower of Babel are there, and they will never be rebuilt. Iraq will never be <laughs> its glorious Babylonian city that it once was. Um, the world knows that something's up, and, but it's only through studying God's word and revelation, studying the Bible, that you see the big picture of what's happening. Hap of what's happening, the world sees a great conspiracy, but God calls it the great controversy. Sola Scriptura, show us in the Bible where we are wrong. Show me in the Bible where it doesn't say what the Bible is saying. And I would just want to um, say once again, there are good people in the Roman Catholic Church, but, the, but the, I'm talking about a system. I'm not talking about a people in the church. I'm talking about a system. Don't quote me and say that out of Mark said, oh yes, um, the people in the uh, Roman Catholic Church are bad. No, we're talking about a system. God has people in the Roman Catholic Church. We're talking about a system. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we are the last reformers. We are the last pro Protestant church still protesting. And finally, the question was asked in the lesson, how can we, how can we um, free ourselves from the influence of Babylon? The book of Revelation describes two systems of religion. As we mentioned, this lesson talks about it. If we are to, if we are to, we are to put on the whole armor of God, remember God's Sabbath. It says, 
worship God who created the heavens and the earth. God is calling us back to worship. And it's going to come down to the Sabbath and the mark of the beast. The Sabbath, which is the seal of God, and Sunday worship, which will be the mark of the beast when it is enforced by law. It is so much in this lesson. It's just too much in this lesson to cover um, in the minutes that we have. So I'll just end with that. That, that's a good that's that's a good place to end because you can't cover so no one's you know we're, we're not skirmishing we, we we can't cover everything out of mark this is why we give bits we give bits we can't cover everything it's too much um, my son and I debated had a debate in Daniel chapter Jan, Daniel chapter 10 says that Daniel fasted for three weeks then that and he said he fasted from the wine and meat uh, no, uh -uh. the interpretation is flesh. The Hebrew word for meat is flesh. So we go as Adventists, we teach a vegetarian diet, the Daniel diet. So how much time now do I have to explain that Daniel was not a vegetarian because it has in the word? Or was he a vegetarian? Because I know we asked the pastor about it because the translation, you can't take away the interpretation. Daniel says, I didn't eat meat for three weeks. Then I went back to my wine. and I went, <laughs> So how do you be explained that he was an alcoholic in, in, in 15 minutes? We can't do that. So we do it in pieces. So everyone receives you. But as we, as we go on, we, 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 we take time as we build up. And so as the elder has shared, go and study. See for yourself. And let's come back and let's reason together. Uh, and, and so that we can have a good diet. And, and I believe that Daniel ate very good, but there's still the interpretation. How do we move the interpretation? But I like how you brought out a mark. I like how you brought out, and, and Dr. Brianna and, and, and Dr. Daniel, yeah, yeah, I think you're next, or is it? No, it's Dr. Brianna. Is that Revelation 17 depicts a scarlet covered beast. Uh, she is Mystery Babylon, the mother of Hollis, meaning she has children. She has a corrupt system. And Daniel chapter 8, this is still a response from Daniel chapter 8. How long will the sanctuary be contaminated? How long will it take for the sanctuary to be cleansed? And it says, on to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Because there has to be a judgment, there has to be a process in order for God to allow people to see, allow people to see false doctrines that oppose the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Let's go. Dr. Brianna, we yes. are now into Wednesday. Yes, Wednesday's lesson, a call to commitment. So in all this discussion, we have two options. We have truth and error. We have Christ's bride, the true church, and false doctrines and false religions. There's only two options. And as Elder Matthews already referenced, there's that story in Daniel about Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when the king of Babylon required that all his noblemen and all the peoples of the earth were to come and bow down and worship this image that he had set up, Daniel's three friends replied to the king and they said, No, we're not going to worship this image. We're going to worship the only true God. And that same question is for us today, now speaking in regards to spiritual Babylon and false doctrines of our days, are we going to choose to worship God and God alone or let ourselves be deceived and obey these other false doctrines, religions, and systems? So the Bible warned us in multiple ways, not only here in Daniel Revelation, but also Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, um, warned that before Jesus' second coming, um, a man of sin would be revealed, the son of perdition. And the way Paul describes it in verse 4, he says this, this system again, all these systems referring to the same thing, this system in verse 4 would who opposes and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
So this system would claim to be God and try to put himself in the place of God. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that not what Lucifer tried to do in heaven? Mm. He said, I want to exalt my throne above the stars of God. I want to be... Lucifer, Satan, who now Satan, has always wanted the worship that alone is God's. And he's just constantly trying to get that through various forms, including the system that we're reading about today. Um, and as Elder Matthews pointed out, Popes claim this authority. Um, I'll read a couple quotes that the lesson mentions here. Pope Leo stated, We hold upon this earth the place of Almighty God. And in another place it says, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. Um, so clearly this system, the Roman Catholic system, claims authority, blasphemous authorities that only belongs to God my, my. Um, and thus fulfills many of these clues given to us in these prophecies of what this or who this system, false system of worship represents. Um, so to counter that, we need to immerse ourselves in truth and in God's word in the Bible. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 21 verse 42 that he was the chief cornerstone, not a pope, not some other religious leader, uh, not your favorite YouTuber, not, no. Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said to them, Have you read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and is it marvelous in your eyes? So Jesus is claiming that he is, and rightfully so, that he is the chief cornerstone. Not the Pope, not someone else. Jesus Christ is. And on top of that, amidst this great controversy between truth and error, Christ and Satan, that takes various forms in our day-to-day -day lives, we know who's going to win. In mm. Revelation 17, verse 14, that's the beautiful thing. I mean, don't you, you know, when you were a child, you wanted to pick the winning side when you played games at school, right? You wanted to be on the side that was going to win. So how much more oh in the great controversy of all time do we want to pick the winning side? And the, the great thing is we know who's going to win. The scriptures tell us that. And the one who's going to win, Jesus Christ, he wants us on his side. And he's done everything to save us and to put us on his side. In Revelation 17, 14, it says... Um, referring to all these false systems. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called chosen, are called chosen and faithful. So, again, Jesus wants to save us. He's provided everything to save us, and He's going to win. He's going to defeat Satan, the devil, and all these false um, systems of worship. So the choice is yours and mine today, just like it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Joshua said to the, I'm going to start with this other one, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, right? He, Elijah gave the children of Israel a choice. He's like, how long will you falter between these two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Don't be like those Israelites. Mm. They weren't willing to step out and say until after, only until after all these miracles happened were they willing to say, the Lord, he is God, follow him. But no, don't be like those people who say, where it says, but the people answered him not a word. No, be like Joshua in Joshua 24, verse 15. Joshua is speaking to the children of Israel after they've crossed into Canaan, the promised land. He says, and if, it seems, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served that were on the other side of the river, right? Today we're speaking about false gods, idolatry, um, false teachings. Joshua says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And Joshua's choices, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I challenge you, is that your decision today? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My, 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 my. Appreciate that, uh, Dr. Brianna. I like that part where uh, you said, more? Oh, <laughs> I like that part who says, who wins? Uh, and, and, the, and the Bible, I, I thought you was going uh, to... Uh, when the Bible depicts uh, in chapter 17, when it describes the woman, 
in Revelation chapter 12, Elder, it describes the dragon, the serpent. He has crowns. He has crowns on his head. huh? And those crowns are diadem, doctor. And the crown represents uh, when pagan kings would go out against God's people, the crowns, uh, uh, the symbolism is one that is in opposition but has authority because they have some sort of jurisdiction. The devil has crowns because he defeated Adam in the Garden of Eden, so he has authority, he has a kingdom. In Revelation chapter 13 out of Mark, you find that the first, the, the, the first beast, she also, right, we'll see because we go to Revelation 17, the system has authority. And the dragon gave him his, I've got to say, I say him, it's a her, gave her her power, his power, and his seat and great authority. But in Revelation chapter 17, you don't see any crowns. Come on, you read chapter 17, verses 1 to 6, you don't see no crowns. Why? But you see the saints of God with crowns, huh? Uh, at Stephanos, which means victory. Uh -huh. Why? Because it's a judgment scene. They have been dis disposed. Uh, they have lost authority, the beast, Catholicism, pagan system of idolatry, fornication. They have lost the right to rule because like Donald Trump, anyone that follows him, they suffer, right? Yeah, we see it and they, they suffer. They go to jail. Where well, anyone that follows Lucifer, Satan, the dragon, is seeing that they suffer. They go to jail, which will be perdition in, in hell. And so let, let me share with you, everyone, as we get ready, doctor, it's your turn coming up. Bless the Lord. Uh, and, and, and listen, everyone, we win. As, the, as we share with you and we explain to you about Catholicism, there would not be Protestantism. There would not have been martyrs who protested against the teachings of Catholicism. There would not be over 500 churches that keep the Sabbath holy. There would not be Protestants all around the world if people didn't see that something is just not right. Something is not wrong. And so we are not targeting anyone, but we are bringing out truth. And in some regards, you would say targeting. Well, the truth will set us free, and the church is called to spread the everlasting gospel. But the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news, everyone. Amen. Doctor, your turn. Can you handle it, doctor? Come I on now. I think, I think I can. Go, go ahead. No, let's Thursday's go. lesson. Thursday's <laughs> lesson is Babylon, the center of idolatry. And I want to bring out that another characteristic of Babylon is idolatry, right? And another, we've been looking at characteristics of a false system that we've identified to be part of that system to be the, the Roman Catholic Church, right? We've seen how the wine represents false teachings, false mm. doctrines. We've seen how it, it rides with the kings of the earth. It, mm. it, it amalgamates political and religious power. And it kind of takes away religious freedom with that, right? Mm. We've seen how it's arrayed in, in purple and scarlet. And I want to bring out, too, about purple and scarlet again because I think this applies to idolatry because we're talking about a system that, cr that takes away mm. from God. It's a system that says it puts in place in itself in the place of God, right? Mm. So if you look at some of the symbolism of what purple and scarlet mean, or at least scarlet, that'll help us because we need to know what purple is made up. It's made up in, in the colors and pigments of blue and red. So we need to understand what blue and red mean in the Bible, right? So if you go to Isaiah 1.18, it talks about scarlet. It says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Come and let us reason together, right? Amen. And we also know, understand that the sacrificial system was very much a red system, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was the blood. And so scarlet can indicate both our sin, right? But it can also indicate the sacrifice, sacrifice of Christ yes. and his covering blood for us. If you go to the Levitical system, you can understand that blue means the law of God. It symbolizes the law of God because every Israelite was asked to wear a blue cord, a blue tassel yes, around the hem of their garment to signify that they remembered and they, they would do the laws of God. So when you combine those, because when we combine pigments, <laughs> we get a combined color and that color is purple, right? And that can symbolize that we have either died to self, right, and allow Christ's sacrificial blood to cover our mishaps of the law, right? Because the law, the wages of sin is death, right? The law is applied. It does not allow us to be forgiven. That's Christ's grace and his mercy that does that. Amen. But the law is what brings condemnation, it says in Paul's writings. So it can be the either purple, the symbol of justification because we are 
accepting Christ's sacrifice for us. We are accepting the love of God and we are saying, you are enough, I'm not. You paid the price of the law. Or, as we do not accept Christ's sacrifice, it can mean that we are yes, sir. now the color of death, mm, right? My mind. We are now the color of death. Yes, sir. And that's what I think it's saying when it's identifying a false system and it's saying, this system has, is identified with the color of death. It is, it is a false system that has taken the place of Christ. It's taken the place of Christ and said, worship me instead. Mm -hmm. It is saying that it is taking away from the worship of God and worshiping itself. And that is the definition of idolatry. Mm -hmm. Let's look at God's response to idolatry. Go with me to Jeremiah 51 verse 47. And I believe that's on the screen for you. Therefore, the days of the, therefore, behold, the days come and I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon and her whole land shall be confounded and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. If you go over just a chapter back to Jeremiah 50, verse 38, it also talks about this. And it says, A drought is upon the waters and they shall be dried up for the land of graven images and they are mad upon their idols. Therefore the wild beasts of the desert and the wild beasts of the islands shall dwell there and the, whole, and the owls shall dwell there and in it shall be no more inhabited for other, neither shall there be, be dwelt in for generation of generation. And this is talking about the, 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 the prophecy of destruction of ancient Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it, over in a verse, just over in verse 41, it says that, Behold, the people shall come from the north, and, shall, and a great nation, and, they sh and many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. So it talks about the destruction of ancient Babylon. And, and, the, and the new kingdom that God used to bring in his will, right? His, his historical um, progression of events with Media and Persia there. <clears throat> so we see that. But let's look, too, also at the system of Babylon and their idols. Because as Dr. Brianna pointed out, God wins, right? Yes. God wins. So let's look at this here. I pointed it out to you. you uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> God wins. <laughs> the three, so Babylon had a lot of gods. They were very polytheistic, but they had three main gods. The god Ea, or Ea, uh, it was the god of wisdom and magic. The god Anu was the god of the sky, and, god, and there was the god Enlil, which was the god of the earth and agriculture. And these were the, their three main large gods. Now look in Jeremiah 51, 15. God wins, remember? Check this out. Jeremiah 51, verse 15, it says, He hath made, speaking of Lord, right? And that's a capital Lord, which means Jehovah, right? Mm -hmm. So Jehovah has made the earth by his power. Okay, I am God over the earth, right? Yes, I yes. am bigger than that God, okay? He has established the world by his wisdom, mm -hmm. right? He's bigger than the God of wisdom. He is the only wise one. And he has stretched out the heavens, okay, he's bigger than the sky too. Yeah, God yeah. wins by his understanding. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters of the, in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings with rain and brings forth the wind out of his treasures. So God wins. God is bigger than the gods of Babylon. He is bigger than our personal gods, because this is a personal message too. Babylon, the center of idolatry, this is what it boils down to, is what are the idols in my life? What are the idols in your life? What are we putting over and above God? Is there something that we're worshiping instead of God? And do I have the ability to surrender, to take Christ's sacrificial blood and apply it to my life and die to myself and accept his justification and say, God, I give you this. I, I will surrender this. I will, I will surrender. I say, please help me, Lord, because I'm not strong enough to do this on my own. So I think that's the ultimate message here. How do we spend our veneration? We've identified, again, a system, and, and this system talks about iconography and, and veneration of the saints. But how do we spend our venomation? Are we, are we venerating icons? Are we venerating idols? In our religious service, are we doing that? In our personal life, are we doing that as well? Where is our, is our 
our veneration going. Go with me, final verse, 1 Thess- Thessalonians um, 5.17. Paul gives us a good, a good um, road map, a very short verse. It says, pray without ceasing. Mm. And that's how Paul and God is asking us to live our life. If we can pray through our actions, through our words, through the life that we live, we can have a prayer, a life of prayer that is a life of prayer without ceasing, right? Because we're able to glorify God, to give Him glory through our actions, our words, our, our bodies, our everything. And that, I think, is the message uh, that is being spoken about here. <clears throat> a- amen. Give him a hearty amen, everyone. Come on now. Uh, uh, this this your first time in Logos? Man, praise the Lord. Amen. I, I wish, like, you know, all three of you, um, Dr. Brianna is the one that makes it plain. Out of Mark is the one that just tells you like it is. And, and, and you just came and you just made it very plain. I wish I had le- less Corey in my diet. I know that I could make it as plain as, as you did. But we want, to, um, we want to close with Logos, but we want to close you with this thought. Sister, my good sister, if you would take me to the last slide, the last slide. We, we, we want to try to share something with you. The church, the church went through great persecution uh, during the time of Nero and Domitian and so many other uh, 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 emperors that wanted to be worshipped. It was even John who says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And God had given me a revelation uh, of Jesus Christ. And John was actually banished to the Isle of Patmos uh, because of his belief and conviction in Jesus Christ. John actually experienced Jesus for himself. But here he is, well, here we are now. The church has gone through great persecution. And there was a time during Decius, uh, an emperor of Rome, uh, he was ordering, as others had ordered, they had ordered uh, sacrifices to the gods, sacrifice to the gods, and also sacrifice to him. And there were many Christians who refused to sacrifice to, the, to, Domit- uh, to Domitian or Decius or any other go- uh, any other emperor who saw himself as a god, and, and, and they refused. And then there was, and they were persecuted, and some lost their lives, some uh, were incarcerated, some were fined, lost their houses. Even during that time, persecution was very great. But then there was a period of quietness where, where, where the emperor came forth, and the emperor wanted to, to, to try to see if he can merge some some uh, calmness and unity and, and the ancestry of, 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 of uh, the, uh, the emperor and the empire where it was calm. And, and therefore, what came across is now during the calm, the church came to a conclusion that we need to find out, let's stay with me now, we need to find out those uh, who offered sacrifices uh, to the gods. See, there was a teaching by Cyprian of Carthage, who was the bishop, that there was no salvation outside of the church. But now the persecution is is quiet right now. People that have uh, been deceitful, uh, we now have to find out who they are in the church, and they have to now confess what they have done wrong. Now, there was a group of individuals called confessors. These ones, uh, they did not buy a license that says, they had a certificate that indicated they offered sacrifices to the emperor, to the gods. But then you had others who purchased certificates but never offered sacrifices to the gods. And then you had others who just went about and they purchased, they did not even purchase certificates, they just offered sacrifices to the gods. And then came along the idea that we need to find out those who rebelled against Christianity, rebelled against God. And so the confessor says, well, listen, they need to come to us because the confessors were held in high esteem. They need to come to us and they need to confess to us. Those who purchased certificates and did not worship, those who purchased certificates and did offer sacrifices, and then those who just outright decided, I'm just going to offer sacrifices to the emperor, to the gods. But those who offered sacrifices to the emperor, to the gods, they were kicked out of the church. Those who offered, I said they offered sacrifices and purchased a certificate, but did not uh, offer the sacrifice, 
they confess what they did wrong to the confessors. And there's those in the, in the face of death who refuse in front of the emperor, in front of the rulers, refuse to bow down, they were seen as confessors. And it was out of that, it was out of that experience that you have the confession booth. It is out of that experience that you have the confession booth. Because over a period of time, people started confessing their sins to the ones that were considered elite, the ones who stood fast against persecution. Hey, you just learned something, didn't you? Do you know that when we study to show ourselves approved, we can learn? Eventually, we had the confession booth, and we have that even now. But the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Jesus Christ. Did you see it? Did you catch it? That there was a period during persecution, a quietness, that the church, universal church, Catholicism, confessors stood up as righteous ones, says, confess. Did you? Did you offer sacrifices to the emperor? And it was discovered those who did and those who did not. Salvation's in the church, and they kept them in the church as the ones who decided who should be saved and who should be lost. I will share with you today, if something that we have shared from the panel and Logos University in this study, go learn for yourself. Study. Come back next week. We have more to share with you, and we'll break it down even more. Or come see the pastor or the elders of the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church or call in and come and worship with us on King Street, where worship is a joy, everyone, and the love is real. Who's closing with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit in this lesson to talk about a difficult truth, to talk about the elephant in the room. We ask, Lord, that you fill us with the Holy Spirit. Give us the courage to share your message to the world. Bless us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning and happy Sabbath. Here are the announcements for today and the upcoming week. We ask for special prayer for all the families that have lost loved ones. Let us remember the family of Marco Warren, his mom, Wendy Warren, his dad, Dwight Warren, his grandfather, Dennis Warren, his aunt, Sabrina Warren, and his uncles, Jamal and Eldon Warren. In our conversations with God today and throughout the week, let us remember those who have requested prayer. Let's switch gears and take a look at what's going on here at Hamilton. At 11 a.m. today, the Bermuda Institute missionaries invite you to join them for a Thanksgiving report. Come and celebrate as they share their stories and give thanks to the Lord for his grace and mercy after their trip to the Dominican Republic. Due to inclement weather, Gem in the Park that was scheduled for today is postponed until June 10th. In the upcoming week, the Community Service Department will serve dinner in the community center on May 31st from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Now let's look at the upcoming events. There'll be an elders meeting on June 12th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. All elders are asked to attend. The next meeting of the Seniors Club will be held on June 13th. There will be a board meeting on June 19th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. All board members are asked to attend. Oakwood University is offering a virtual STEM summer program. Please see the bulletin for this once in a lifetime offer. The next meeting of the communication department is on June 26th. We have some college graduates in our midst. Congratulations to Alex Doyling, who graduated with a Bachelor's in Business Management, and congratulations to Elysia Oboy, who graduated with a Bachelor's in Liberal Arts with a concentration 
in education. Well done, graduates. Now let's celebrate all the birthdays for today and the upcoming week. Anniversary. And on May 29th, Shemaine and Michael Spencer celebrate their anniversary. Happy anniversary. It is one thing to believe in God, that he exists, and quite another to believe God, to accept his promise to you as a sure thing. We must believe in more than God's existence. We must believe his promises and statements are available to us. And we must believe that he hears us when we pray. The difference between the person who believes in God and the person who believes God is that the latter will speak and act according to what he believes. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Romans 4, 3. He believed God and through his faith, he received a miracle.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. Our call to worship this morning will be a responsive reading and it will be taken out of Psalm 138. We will read the whole Psalm. You will find it on the screen or you can read it in your Bible. Can we stand for the call to worship? I'm going to read verse one, you will read verse two and so forth. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. In the day when I cried, thou answerest me, and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. So the Lord be high, yet mercy rests on the land, till the crowd be broken all. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies and thy right hand shall save me. Together, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. You have now been called to worship. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Amen. The song says, come let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I ask that you sing along with us as we sing this. Come let us worship. Father in heaven, we indeed have come into this place to worship, to give you all of the praise. We beg right now that you would fall afresh on this assembly, that you would make your presence felt like never before. We pray that lives are changed and someone gets a closer glimpse of the man we call Jesus Christ. We have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that yesterday was a very mocky Bermuda day. It was a very... Uh, wet Bermuda Day, but if we look on the positive side, the truth of the matter is, is that 
I don't know if there's one tank that's empty in this country today because you have been good. You have been merciful. You have blessed the people. I do feel sorry for the water truck owners, but the truth of the matter is, is that there's a lot of people that saved a lot of money yesterday because of your goodness and your grace. So we've come here to worship you, if that's all right with you. May everything we do to be to your name's honor and glory. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say, amen, amen. Oh, let's sing it out. Let's worship him, worship him. says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Is he yours today? He is yours. He's mine as well. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
morning, good morning. And happy Sabbath to all of you. It's so good to see everyone out there. Well, I can tell you right now, it feels special already. Yes. I know we have some special guests in here, and uh, you'll get to meet them a little later. But we have the worshipers. Yes. Yes. Amen. We have the worshipers here to take us and lift us to God's throne today. Amen. And so as we begin to prepare our hearts for prayer, I, I ask that you just take a moment right now just to contemplate where you are and who you're in the presence of. And as we lift our minds and our hearts to Jesus, that together, together, we can answer the very throne room of God in heaven, together. What a beautiful experience it's going to be. As the choir blesses us, to prepare us, let our minds remember who we are in the presence of. Amen. together. Our great God, our Heavenly Father. Father, we understand whose presence we are in today. The very creator of heaven and earth, this universe was created by you for your purpose. Because we understand just who you are, God, we bow before you humbly, giving you honor and praise for who you are. Father, we pray that your very spirit will enter into every heart that is in this place today, that we will have an experience with you like never before. God, this world is quickly coming to an end and we need to feel your presence 
We need to experience who you are. We need to draw closer to you. Father, we thank you for the freedom we have in Jesus. And we thank you, God, for filling this place today with all those who are yours, God. They are here today because of your purpose, your reason, your desire. And so, Father, we pray your blessings upon us, especially we remember our special guest today from the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute. Amen. Oh, God, what a work they do. Amen. They are your hands and your feet and your mouths, Lord, in helping your children through difficult times. So we pray that your spirit's blessings will rest upon them greatly, Lord, that they can be empowered to continually do your will. And Father, we pray for our special guest, our chief fire officer, one of our very own, God, whom you have blessed to be in this position of responsibility. We pray for him, God, for wisdom, and that you will give him discernment and understanding of how to take care of this island of 65,000 people. Every day he's responsible for that. And I pray that, God, you will give him wisdom beyond what any of us can give. So bless him and may your presence and your spirit rest with the Bermuda Fire and Rescue Service. That they will continue to be your hands, your feet, and your mouths in helping your people in this island. God, we pray today for this very service. That some soul, some heart will be set free today. Father, we pray that you will be seen that you will be known, and that, Father, someone will experience freedom in Jesus today. This is a special time, God, and we experience your presence already this morning. As the singers sing, God, it's like we're in heaven, worshiping you face to face. And so, God, we pray that as we move into this, this service, that as the word is spoken to us through Pastor Steve, that Jesus your presence and your power will rest upon him, that he will speak words that will answer into every heart, to answer every need, God, to fulfill every desire. For you alone know every heart in this place, and you know what it will be that will touch and speak to them. I pray that we will open our hearts to receive it. So God, bless this service, we pray. And let all the church say, Amen. Amen. want to invite our primary class up for a special selection.
I hear you can't get it in that class unless you sing a hymn. You can't get into that class. So just warm up your voices. But we're going to um, invite our kindergarten class to come up and create a role, create a role, sorry, for a welcome. This is the part of the service where some person comes up to greet you. Everyone, just get a song. We know they do well. It's just loud. It's always the same. So kindergarten and grade rules up school class has taken over the welcome today. and you like them and it's not a girl, give them a hug. <laughs> Verse 2 to 3 says, Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing palms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. Amen. Thank you for, wor for choosing the to Hamilton worship at Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church where the worship is a joy and the love is real.
Can the church say amen? Come on, can we put our hands together for our young people? Cradle roll, kindergarten, primary class. Let's thank God for the leadership down there as well uh, that are doing a wonderful job with our uh, young people. I just want to see right here. If we can pull up those slides for me uh, so we can get through. We want to welcome all of you here uh, to this wonderful day we call Community Guest Day. And before we move further, uh, we want to go ahead and invite all of our guests, visitors that are here with us today, I want to invite you to kindly stand at this time. If you're visiting with us today, perhaps for the first time, just stand. Come on, can the church say amen? Put your hands together for these wonderful people. Come here today, today. Come on, stand up, stand up, stand up. Put your hands together for them. Welcome you here to God's house uh, today. Amen. There are so many of you here. There are so many of you here, but I will start here. Tell us, tell us your name and where you're from, if that's all right. Okay, Delicia and Danique, and you're from England, visiting from England. Can the church say amen? Talk to me, kind sir. I'm sorry, no? Oh, praise God, man. Brother Birch, he's representing the child and adolescent service. Put your hands together for him, church. God bless you, bless you. You can be seated as I call you. Yes. Yes. From Fort Lauderdale. Oh, that's beautiful. God bless you. So good to have you here. So good to have you here with us today. So good to have you here with us today. This lovely two that are standing together. Praise the Lord. Can the church say amen? Now, now, before, before you sit down with a name like Divinity, uh, I'm very shocked that this is the first time we've seen you in this place. We want to see you here a whole lot more. Is that all right? Can the church say amen? Oh, what a beautiful name. God bless you. Have a seat. Talk to me. Okay. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Come on. Can the church say amen? Now, now, I see this young man here standing to my left, and I've heard about him. I've heard some things. I've heard some things. Uh, this young man here is named uh, Daniel Newbrander. And uh, you see who he's sitting next to, Dr. Williams. You see who he's sitting next to. He believes he's the one. This is what he believes. This is what he believes. And I, I, I know it's not official, but, but, but I think she believes it as well. Can the church say amen? amen. You know, I saw him hugging in church and holding hands. I, I, don't, I don't believe we've given that much permission. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't think we've given that much permission. But Dr. Uh, New Brenda, I believe a doctor of physical therapy, am I correct? We welcome you here to God's house. You should have saw him. Uh, you know, Jacob, you know, he did some things, you know, to get with Rachel. He had to go work for a bunch of years. The guy, she made this man run 24th of May uh, just to be with her. It's absolutely unreal. Come on, put your hands together for that. God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Good to have you here with us. Lovely lady here at the back. Tell us. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. 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 So glad to have Sister Hudson coming to us all the way from the beautiful parish of Warwick. I saw Dr. Gibbons, I saw Dr. Gibbons earlier. Where's she at? I think I saw her. Yes, she's behind me. 
Oh, she's moved. She's moved. Come on. Come on, stand up, man. Always good to see uh, the penultimate pastor's daughter here in God's house. Can the church say amen? God bless you. God bless you. Good to have you here. Good to have you here with us today. Yes, somebody else I missed? Oh, Brother Eversley's back in the house. Come on, can the church say amen? Yes, yes, yes. I see Mason. I see Mason, Brother Mason O'Brien. God bless you, man. Good to have you back in God's house. God to bless all of you guys. Come on, let's get to these slides. Yes, somebody else? Talk to me. Sue? Oh, Denise. Hey, hey, come on. Go on, stand up, man. Come on, good to have you back home. Can the church say amen? Amen. Samantha's so back in the building. All right, all right. Let's get to these slides very quickly, uh, if you would. Yes, God's going to set you free in 2023. That is our theme this year. We encourage you to let Jesus make those necessary changes in your life uh, to set you free. Come on, next slide, if you would. Uh, the funeral is this week. I believe this coming Thursday at 2 p.m. at PAC Field uh, for uh, Marco uh, Warren. It's going to be right there at the PAC Field. And if you'd like to come, uh, we invite you uh, to come out and support the family uh, during this time. It's Community Guest Day, and we are honored to have all of our visiting friends with us today. I want to thank our Sabbath School Department, uh, along uh, with its leader, uh, and that of Sister Chanel Bean, for leading out uh, in this day. Can the church say amen? amen. We praise God. We praise God. I'm going to keep moving quickly because we have some honored guests that we want to honor. We want to continue to pray for the kids. I think they started their finals on Thursday, but they got more finals to come. Yes, been working those finals, doing great. Mike said he's killing the finals. He's getting straight A's, <laughs> straight A's. This dumb is up. Uh, and we're happy for him uh, this afternoon. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but it's Jesus and me. It's a jam in the park. Uh, Bermuda Conference, I guess it's canceled. You killed it. The rain yesterday took all of your faith. Just wiped it away. Okay, all right. All right. So we won't have that today. That's not going to happen. Hey, listen, class of 2023. Uh, is back with us today. I want to congratulate Brother Alex Doyle. Can the church say amen? <laughs> Bachelor in Business, Bachelor of Arts in Business uh, from Kutztown University. And then there's another one in here. Yes, Alicia Allboy, Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Studies uh, from Endicott College. Is she in the house today? Is she in the house? She is in the house. Let's make her stand up. Make her stand up with her 3.74 GPA. Come on now. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Appreciate you sitting in that row. Keep a very close eye on Dr. Newbrand. I appreciate it greatly. Uh, next slide, if you would. Next slide, next slide. Yes, big shift, big shift, big shift. Uh, Elder Douglas, uh, I want to ask him to uh, stand wherever he is. If he'll just stand so you guys know who I'm talking about, Elder Douglas has served this church faithfully for the last uh, 15 years. Can the church say amen? <laughs> Praise God for him. And uh, uh, as he's getting an approaching retirement. Uh, he's decided to move back to his house uh, in Orlando, Florida. Uh, and he will be, yeah, it's, it's very bad. The elders, it's really, really bad. But, but, uh, but he'll be leaving us uh, probably the first week in August. And so we just have a couple of more months with him. Uh, he has been a very faithful servant of this church, and we'll elaborate on the Sabbath that we honor him. But behind the scenes, he has worked tirelessly with the elders, with the elders' board, with visitations, with scheduling, uh, with prayer meetings, with everything. He has been faithful, faithful, and more faithful. And so we're going to miss him tremendously. We're going to miss him tremendously. And there's so much that he does. We felt it necessary with the Board of Elders and the Board, uh, and even brought it to the business meeting uh, last week, uh, that we find and start training his replacement. The elders met together, they prayed together, they took vote, and they have recommended, uh, with the approval of the Board, uh, and affirming to uh, the actual business meeting this last week, uh, the name uh, as the new second elder as of August. He will not push Elder Douglas out the way. He will wait his turn. Uh, but the new second elder in training, in training, uh, is none other than uh, Elder Jamal Oldboy. Can the church say amen? I want to invite him to come and stand at this time. He'll come and stand at this time. Uh, he has a lot of work to do. He has a lot of work to do. Elder Douglas carries a massive load. 
um, and it's a lot, and it's a lot of training. They've already started having lots of training sessions together to make sure that we have a smooth transition this come August. We're going to miss Elder Douglas tremendously, and we're going to pick one of those Sabbaths down there in July uh, to celebrate uh, him and all that he has been to this community of faith. Can the church say amen? Come on, put your hands together for Elder Douglas. We're going to miss him. I, uh, I thought I'd bring him up, but I didn't want him to cry today, so I said, not today. Next time, next time he can cry, he can cry as long as he wants. Hey, listen, we got some May Sabbath birthdays and anniversaries. Vanetta Simmons, can we say amen? Uh, Cassandra Hayward, Cassandra Hayward is celebrating a birthday today. And on this Sabbath, Derek and Helen Burrows are celebrating their anniversary. Can the church say amen? Amen, 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 amen. amen. Yeah, yeah. That's the great Elder Alan Fox there in, in, in rare form, in rare form. Uh, yes, you know, that's actually his normal form. Uh, the great runner that he is, he's great. I know y'all saw him, if you watched on TV, he was right there with the first lady holding it down, man. And he always represents us well. God bless you, Elder. God bless you, man, uh, for the great run yesterday. Listen, we're not going to get into fellowship time yet. Uh, we want to go ahead and quickly move into, we'll do fellowship time after uh, the special presentation. We want to invite our Sabbath school superintendent if she'll come forward at this time. And let's go into these uh, special presentations for community guest day. You want to sit down? Thank you, Pastor. Why do I feel so nervous, church? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah. Whew. Well, it is an honor to be able to stand before you as your Sabbath school superintendent and to serve this uh, wonderful church and to be a part of the team that brings you Sabbath school uh, lesson study in person weekly, Lagos University weekly, um, online, um, and to give oversight to our lower division and to work along with Sister Velvet in uh, lower division and to see our young people always eager and excited to study their lesson and to be a part of worship. And didn't they do a wonderful job here this morning? I want you, church, to please to continue to encourage our young people in the things of God. There are so many things that our young people can be involved in, but if we make the things of God more exciting, more valuable, and more of interest, and let them know they have a place here, we will not have to worry about the future of the church because they will be here working and serving in the church in this time. They won't have to wait for a time. Their time is now. And so I want you to continue to encourage our young people to be in the things of God. And so you will see one of our young people who is on the camera today. Our other young people are um, taking part in the mission service um, over at uh, Southampton Church. Um, so our early teen class is not with us today because they are there um, giving um, ministry around their mission trip. And then our adults. Um, our adult service continues to give leadership and study to our adults here in our sanctuary. And I also have a team that work along with me, so I do not do this alone. And so to the superintendents, the assistant superintendents who serve with me, uh, Dr. Shanna Lee Birch, and Sister Quinicia Williams, I want to say thank you for your service. I want to say thank you to our secretaries who serve with us today with, in the persons of Sister Yuline uh, Furbit and also in the persons of uh, Sister Laverne Goins and also in the person of Sister Olga Smith. And I want you to pray for Sister Smith. You always see her buzzing around and serving um, with us, picking up our envelopes. Um, she's not well today, and she's viewing online, and so I want you to keep her in your prayers. Sister Smith, we miss you, and we love you. And so I'm now going to go into our presentation for today. So our first presentation is in honoring and acknowledging the service of the new chief fire officer. 
He is a veteran fire officer who has been appointed to be the new chief fire officer of Bermuda Rest Fire and Rescue Service. It is the person of Brother Elder Dana Lovell. Amen. Amen. Mr. Lovell joined the service 38 years ago Mercy. and has been serving as acting fire chief officer since May of 2022. Before this appointment, he served as the assistant fire chief officer, a divisional officer for operations, a staff officer, among other ranks. Mr. Lovell is a humble servant to the community. He states, I am proud and humbled by my appointment. I am grateful to the Bermuda Fire and Rescue Service and the ministry for this opportunity. The future of the BFRS is vivid, and I hope my appointment will serve as a shining example of the many opportunities available within the organization. I've always said that when you join the Bermuda Fire Rescue Service, it's not just a job, it's a career. I also wish to thank my family for their support throughout my service. Without their support, it would have been a difficult to endure the many challenges and pressures accompanying such important work and dedication. Applauding his appointment, the Minister of National Security, Mr. Michael Weeks states, we are very grateful to have Mr. Lovell in this role. He brings the highest level of personal integrity, having worked his way up through the ranks from a firefighter. His impressive record of service to the Bermuda Fire and Rescue Service and his rise to the highest office in the organization is proof that Bermudian firefighters can expect a rewarding and exciting career. And then according to a ministry spokesman, Mr. Lovell will, re will lead the Bermuda Fire Service mission to partner with the community to provide quality education and fire prevention programs that identify safety risks and respond to emergencies effectively, efficiently, and professionally. Chief Fire Officer Dana Lovell, known you a long time. I, I, I can't even count now. But it is an honor that we here at the Hamilton Seven Day Adventist Church, where worship is a joy and the love is real, to extend love to you today in acknowledging that you, one of us, a Seventh Day Adventist, has reached the ranks, the highest ranks, within the Bermuda Service and Rescue, and we fire and rescue. And we want to know, let you know that we are proud of you for the work that you have done and that God has used you to be able to share your ministry for 38 years to such a wonderful service and to your family who have allowed you to do so. <laughs> Sir, and your lovely wife, Dana, come and join us at the podium. Well, let's stand up. Let's stand up, church. Let's stand up before you. Let's stand up. Let's stand up before Yes, yes, yes. This certificate of recognition is to fire, sorry, Chief Fire Officer Dana Lovell for being the first seven-day Adventist to re achieve the rank of Chief Fire Officer for the Bermuda Service, Bermuda Fire and Rescue Service, presented at Community Guest Day, May 2027 20, in 2023. Signed by David Steed II, pastor, and myself, Chanel being Sabbath School Superintendent, but also from our Sabbath School Committee and also the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. We love you and congratulations, sir. And so we have a plaque that reads the same that is on the certificate. 
and Colossians 3, 23 and 24 is the scripture text that we have chosen to share with you. And may God continue to bless you as you serve. And for Sister Dana, we want to say there's always a wonderful woman who stands behind a man who allows this service to continue. And we know that it may not have been easy, but with you by his side, I'm sure it has been a breeze. And so we want to say thank you. <laughs> we want to say thank you for allowing Dana to serve the community of Bermuda, but also his church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you. So much. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Sabbath School, Sister Chanel, all of the members of the community of faith in Bermuda, and in particular, Hamilton Church. Thank you so much for the acknowledgement. I'm mindful of the passage of scripture in Proverbs chapter 50 and verse 35, that the fear of the Lord is, is the beginning of instruction and before honor, humility. And I try to live by those words. I'm thankful for the recognition. Please accept my, my most humble and my most sincere appreciation. And thank you very much. Thank you. At, and he did not come alone. He does have his, his family with him. And so we want to ask for Kamali and Aaron and and Jacqueline to come on and and receive this with your dad. <laughs> come on up. You can come on up this way. Thank you. When we met as a council to consider the organizations that we would want to honor, it was a list. And one of the names that came forth received a resounding vote of yes, yes, and yes, and wonderful, and yes. And that is the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute who serve our community in the way of mental health, education, and support, and services that at one point may have been or may still be in some eyes not a service that many of us may want to use. It, often sometimes comes with stigma and it comes with shame and it comes with regret it comes with unknowns but I want to say that the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute has been a pillar in our community to ensure that those who are in need of services get what they need. And over the years, we have seen where our mental health is extremely important. We usually talk about our physical health. We usually talk about what we eat. We talk about exercise. We talk about all those things that are really take care of our physical bodies. And we know that our bodies are the temple of our living God. And so when we think about our temples, we also are reminding about our minds. And our minds are important because they run the rest of our bodies. 
And if we don't have our minds right, our bodies are not right either. And so we have been commissioned by God that we keep our minds stayed on him and he will keep us in perfect peace. And so our God has given those who have the abilities to understand these beautiful minds that he has created, that when our minds just want to take us somewhere else, he has some people that he has put into place to help us to get back right on track. And so the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute has been a part of our community, and we know that they've changed their name over the years. And I think that that name has lended to the importance of wellness, and when we have mental wellness, then we have a community that can thrive. And so in the services that they offer, I'm not going to go into all of them because there is a presentation that will share them. But there's also a youth arm to Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, and that is Child and Adolescent Services. And Child and Adolescent Services offer services to our young people between the ages of 4 and 18 where if they are in need of emotional, mental health, wellness, they have those services available to them. And so we have two people who are here to represent those two entities today. And they are in the persons of Mrs. Karen Grant Simmons and Mr. David Birch. Sorry. Lloyd. I'm sorry. But I know his name is Lloyd. I, I see him when I go. <laughs> Lloyd, <laughs> Mr. Lloyd Birch, and we want to welcome you to the podium and so that you can receive your awards and certificates on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic. Ms. Grant Simmons and Mr. Birch, we want to say on behalf of the Hamilton Seven-Day Adventist Church, thank you so much for all that you do in the community. And you, will, you have a slide presentation that will let us know more about that as we go forth. But we just want to say that if it wasn't for the work that you do in our community, there would not be the mental health wellness that is important to have a community that will continue to thrive and continue to press on and to, to give on to its children and young people who come behind. And so we are grateful and we are thankful for the ministry that you and your team of many do on a regular basis. We know that it may not be easy, but we are praying that God will continue to give you all the strength to know how to be able to lead in these trying times. And we know that when Jesus comes, the work that you have done will be noticed beyond measure. So we say thank you again. And we have a plaque for you and a certificate. And it reads to the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute for their dedicated service and tireless commitment to providing continuous mental health education services and support to the Bermuda community. Presented at the Community Guest Day May 27, 2023, signed by the pastor, David D.W. Steed II, and myself, Chanel Bean, Sabbath School Superintendent. And so I want to thank you. And so we have a plaque for you and it reads exactly what is on your certificate so that you can put up in your offices. And this is for you, you can hold on to that. And the scripture text there is, I'm sorry, is 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. And I actually wanna read that particular scripture text if you will uh, bear with me, um, family. I'm sorry, I said 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be God, even the Father of our God, Jesus Christ, for the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, 
that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherein we ourselves are comforted of God. And so may you go with that scripture as you continue to serve the, com the Bermudan community. And I also wanted to present you, Ms. Grant Simmons, with a bouquet of flowers. And thank you again for the services that you grant to our community. Amen. Thank you. Now, I should have asked my team to come forth and take a picture with us. So if you are part of the Sabbath School team, please come forth and take a picture with us. And we'll do one with the fire chief um, later. But um, Sister Goins, Dr. Birch, just come on the side, Sister Velvet. Yes, it's for the plaque. Sabbath school teachers, we have our elder of Sabbath school. We have um, Sabbath school teachers. I know that we have elder Simons over in the in the kitchen who's helping with gourmet to make sure that our meal is presented well and for us. Here comes Sister Simons. Any one of our other teachers are here with us today? Okay. Quin Quinicia, thank you. <laughs> She thought she was going to get away today. Thank you for that good eye, um, Elder. On behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, we are truly humbled and honored to receive this award because oftentimes mental health is on the back burner. It is not recognized. But we know that the health message is the right arm of the gospel. And it is essential for us not to be only physically, spiritually, and socially healthy, but to be mentally healthy. Because it is his will that we will prosper and be in health, even as our souls prosper it. So thank you very much. Again, thank you very much, honorees. We are honored that you accepted the invitation and we had an opportunity to extend honors to you on behalf of the work that you do for the Bermuda community. Please remember to stay by with us. Lunch is being served. You are our guest. We would love to join and dine with you. Church, thank you so much for your time this morning in allowing these presentations to take place. May God continue to bless us as we do his work in this part of the vineyard. Can the church say amen? amen. Can the church say amen? amen. I understand, uh, I just got to note that in essence, uh, one of, I don't see her here today, but uh, one of the directors at Mom, she's dying. <laughs> I'm looking to yes, is our own uh, doctor. Uh, I'm sorry, is, uh, Sister Marissa uh, <laughs> Rogers. <laughs> you <only> messed me <laughs> up. <laughs> messed me up. But you are director over there. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Come on, stand up there. Stand up there. You should have been in the picture. You should have been in the picture with us. You should have been in the. You should have been in the picture with us. Come on, put your hands together. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Beautiful. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Uh, in essence, uh, what, a, what a blessed time to be here today uh, in God's service. So happy to acknowledge uh, Maui and uh, uh, Brother Lovell, man, who, uh, what, a, what, a, what a burden to carry. <laughs> what a burden to carry. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I know it's a lot to carry because, you know, I have to deal with two of your workers all the time. You know what I'm saying? So I know it's a burden to carry. No, I'm just playing. But no, they, these gentlemen here are very proud to work underneath of you. 
Um, and we're honored. We're just honored that you are here uh, in this place today and we could acknowledge you. It's amazing because as we get ready uh, to fellowship together, just want to remind you guys of a text that's just been on my mind these last couple of months. And the text simply says, you know, it just kind of, the text, it's, a, it's one of those texts that kind of just change the atmosphere, you know? Uh, you know, I think Sister Keynes thinks her text is the best text to change the atmosphere. You know, the angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him, you know, uh, and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, this is kind of a play on that. Psalm 107 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And then verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, Lord, help us. It said, Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And I'm wondering today if there's somebody in God's house that has been redeemed from the hand of the enemy that can testify today, that's willing to just say so. Ah, oh, you can testify. Come on, some of you were still cheering for the gumbays in the rain yesterday. I think you can give God some praise this morning. Is that all right today? Ah, oh, some of you, some of you were running with soggy feet, but, but you kept on going. Uh, and we are here today to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Do me a favor. If you would just all stand for us at this time, let us stand together. Come on, help me out if you would. Repeat after me this morning. There's no place uh, like this place, uh, anywhere near this place. Uh, so this must be the place. Uh, come on, do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor. Look your neighbor in the eyes. I know we got some visitors here. Look your neighbor in the eyes. Now, now, visitors, you have to understand, when you look the neighbor in the eyes of this church, you're not allowed to blink, all right? So look them in the eyes. No blinking, no blinking, no blinking. Say neighbor. neighbor. Come on, say neighbor. neighbor. Loosen, up. Loosen up. You're in the right place. Uh, come on now, let's worship the Lord. Let's sing together. Welcome to Hamilton SDA as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Welcome to Hamilton SDA.
We're going to invite our little ones up. Can we play the presentation? Our Health Nugget presentation this morning will be brought to us by the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute. And you'll be able to hear about the wonderful work that they do and the services that are offered to our community. It appears we may be having some difficulty with that at this moment. I will check with our technician. We, we can go ahead with the children's story. Let's invite our little ones up for children's story and children's uh, scripture reading and offering.
even when I'm growing old. Even when? Let it shine till Jesus comes. Let it shine till Jesus comes. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is from Genesis 5, verse 24. You not know, walk faithfully with God, but then he was no more he because God took, God took him away. Thank you. Thank you, Amir and Vali. That was awesome. Thank you, you guys. Good morning, boys and girls. Caleb, I don't think you'll be able to see, but I'll pull the table back so that you can see. Hi, Caleb. Okay. So I've been taxed with sharing the children's story this morning. I have two other Bible verses. One of them is from Proverbs 16, verse 24, and it says, Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and healthy for the body. And the second Bible text is from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, and it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Well, I don't really have a, a title for my story today, you guys. But my story is about being a light. Have you guys ever heard that before, that saying before? For you to be a light? Yes. Okay. Michael says yes. And yes. Okay. Well, what do you guys think it means? The Bible also tells us to let your light shine. What does it mean to be a light? Anybody can help me? What do you think? To be nice to people? That's a good one. Yes, Michael. Yes, Mateo. To be kind to people. There you go. To be kind. Amir, shout it out loud. To be pleasant. To be pleasant. Taylor. To show what you know about God. He, there you go. To show what you know about God to others, May May. To be obedient. To be obedient. That's another good one. Joshua. To be helpful. Oh, my goodness, you, have, you guys have great answers. All of those are examples of how to be a light. So, 
I'm sorry. Next one, okay? You'll help me with the next one. So you guys, I have two lighters. I, I actually need a stick. Thank you. I have two lighters here. And my lighters represent people, okay? I'm going to tell you a story about two girls. This story I actually chose before I knew that my sister was going to be here. So it's about her. And <laughs> So one little girl's name is going to be Melissiana. <laughs> so Melissiana, and that's her light. And then the other little girl's name, her name is Jenny. Okay, that was Melissiana's best friend, Jenny. And that's her light. Now, Melissiana and Jenny, they both were kind, loving people. Okay, whenever they came into the classroom in the mornings, they greeted their teachers. Good morning, teachers. Good morning, friends. They were so loving. They, did, they listened to the teachers. They were obedient. They did their work. If a friend needed a pencil or an eraser, they were quick to, to share whatever they had. They were optimistic. That means, that's a big word. That means when something bad happens or if there's a person that isn't so kind. They try to find the good in people or the good in something, right? They were always so good, and they were just a bright light. They were a joy to be around, but there was something different about these two people. Well, Jenny wasn't always liked by everybody. Sometimes she was pushed away by people, okay? And sometimes, well, the reason why she was pushed away was because she was different. She had a disability. She limped, right? She had one broken leg, and so she walked with a limp. And people thought that that was weird. Why is she walking like that? Right? And Jenny didn't always have the nicest um, school clothes or shoes or the backpack. She didn't really have nice stuff. So people would tease her about that. Like, why are you wearing that? Why are you wearing that old bag or that old dress? And your shoes don't even look nice. They're dirty, right? Then the other thing about Jenny was that she didn't smell good. So people didn't like that. And they were like, ew, you smell. I don't want to be around you. Why do I want to be your friend? I don't want to be your friend. And so Jenny was drowning in all of this negativity, right? Let's see. I'm going to see something. Do you guys think that Jenny's light is going to shine? Yes. No, it's not shining, is it? Right? Do you think she would be able to be kind or to share her light with other people? No. no. And so she was having a really hard time to be kind to others to be respectful to her teachers, and probably at home too, she struggled, right? But remember, there was Melissiana with a light, right? She also had a light about her. And guess what? Melissiana began to defend Jenny. She, whenever people would tease her, she says, no, that's my friend. You can't talk about her, right? And so she would share her light with Jenny. Whenever people spoke about Jenny's clothes or her shoes or teased her about the way that she smelled, Melissiana would say, you can't do that. That's not a kind thing to do. And every time she would share her light with Jenny. And guess what would happen? Little by little, oh, she reignited the light in Jenny. And the moral of the story is, boys and girls, when we share our light with others, it not only helps us to shine brighter, because can you imagine if all of us let the light inside of us shine? It would be really bright, wouldn't it? Yeah, but outside of that, it would also help those whose lights have dimmed to be reignited and re-sparked. And we do this by doing what, boys and girls? We do this by being kind, by... Be thankful. That's right. That's a good one. Yes, Mateo. We do this by being helpful. That was a good one. Just shout them out. Cheerful, grateful. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, by being obedient and responsible. Those are all great ways to shine our light, right? And God tells us that we have to speak kindly to people because it does good to our souls, right? We have to encourage one another. And so that's the moral of my story today. And I pray that you guys can take that beyond today and be a light to the world so that ultimately people can get to know the true light who is in us, and that's Jesus Christ, right? Amen. All right. Anybody wants to pray for me? You want to drink the water? Okay. <laughs> Anybody wants to pray? You want to pray? Sure. Heavenly Father, thank you for being this effectful and help us to be good boys and girls and help us to love we mommy. And be kind to each other. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, boys and girls, you guys can return to your seats nice and quietly. Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute. At Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, we have mental health services. Under mental health services falls child and adolescent services, community mental health services, as well Within Community Mental Health Services, it accepts referrals for persons requiring services inclusive of psychological, emotional, psychiatric assessment, treatment, education, and rehabilitation. Within Community Mental Health Services, there is a rating priority criteria. Emergency, risk to self or others which require immediate intervention. Urgent, client is deteriorating mentally and an assessment is arranged within seven days non-urgent. An appointment is given within 14 days. Referrals can be made by any source, including self. We can be contacted at 249-3432 or 249-3433, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. After hours or holidays, we can be contacted at 249-3258. Suicidal Crisis Line, 239-1111. There are two other directorates at MWI, Turning Point, Substance Misuse and Abuse. They have inpatient detox services, intensive outpatient services, and a methadone clinic. Second, there's intellectual disability. They have community group homes and intervention, day services, and respite care. Child and Adolescent Services. Our philosophy is that children have the unique ability to thrive in the face of adversity with each new day presenting as an opportunity for growth and change. Our mission is to provide comprehensive, 
quality mental health services to children, adolescents, and their families who demonstrate psychiatric symptoms of a severity, frequency, and duration that impacts their social, vocational, and educational functioning through access to multidisciplinary inpatient, outpatient, and community care, which may include our core services. Our core services include acute inpatient care and outpatient care. Within inpatient care, there is nursing and medication management if clinically indicated. Within outpatient care, children and adolescents could receive individual therapy, psychiatric consultations, family therapy, and community-based interventions. This is not an extensive list of what services can be provided within the core services. We provide services to children and adolescents who are between the ages of 5 to 18 years old and who are residing in Bermuda during the course of their treatment, who present with moderate to severe presentation of mental health symptoms, those who are experiencing serious emotional disturbances which interferes with their ability to function in more than two life areas, and those who wish to terminate pregnancy. Children and adolescents who present with high acuity safety concerns to themselves or others and who require further assessment of moderate severe mental health presentation would require or meet criteria for inpatient services. Our support services include, but is not limited to, our Autism Spectrum Disorder Clinic, facilitation of groups, and mental health awareness and prevention. If you require any additional information or would like to make a referral, we can be found at 44 Devon Springs Road in Devonshire, or we can be contacted via telephone at 239-6344. Referrals can be faxed to 232-1512, or you can send them to cas.referrals at bhb.bm. Thank you for your time and attention. Good afternoon, church family. I ask the question, why do we exist? What is the purpose of the body of Christ? Why are we here? I ask you a question, why are we here? To serve, but more importantly, we are here to make disciples. That is one of our main objectives. But and to do that, it's going to take time. It's going to take, yes, practice. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take talent. And it's also going to take our ties. You see, we can't do anything without those three elements. Of course, we're going to couple and join God. But it requires us time, talent, and time. In the spirit of prophecy in the book, Christ's Object Lessons, chapter 23, entitled The Lord's Vineyard, on page 301, Sister White says, we are to praise God by tangible service, time, talent, and tithes, by doing all in our power to advance the glory of his name. The Israelites were taught to devote a tithe of all their income to the service of the sanctuary. Besides this, they were to bring sin offerings, free will gifts, and offerings of gratitude. She goes on to say, these were the means for supporting the ministry of the gospel for that time. God expects no less from us than he expected from his people anciently. Service to God includes personal ministry, time, talent, and tithes. By personal effort, we are to cooperate with him for saving of the world. And I want to encourage us today as we contemplate on these words and as we seek God to provide the increase by us 
partnering with him, that you will give up your time, your talent, and your tithes. And by doing so, by doing so, we would help spread the gospel and help finish his work. And with that, I want to invite our deacons and our deaconess to come forward as we prepare to lift this morning's tithes and our offerings. And for our emphasis this morning or this week, the loose offering is for the local church budget. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have been so good to us. You give us life and breath in our lungs. You give us means and ways to earn a living. And now we have a responsibility to return back to you what is rightfully yours. But more importantly, Father, you have instructed us to make disciples. And by doing so, by doing so, we return a portion of our earnings to help build up your kingdom. And I pray the monies that are collected today will do just that. And when you come, you will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Help us to be faithful until the very end. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. So my energetic junior class will be singing Joy by and by. It is number 430 in the hymnal. Um, from the beautiful island of St. Lucia. So I have taught them the last verse in Creole. We speak Creole in St. Lucia. And they've done very well practicing this. So we're going to sing to you. Be blessed. Oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. Joy when the rivers gather whole. Bringing the seed of sadness to the new Jerusalem. Joy, joy, joy. joy.
Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 19. Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 19. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one with another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and not curse. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate. And be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. May the word of God become who we are. Good afternoon, church. Our speaker today is Pastor David Donald Winfield Steed, the second. Can't forget the second. He was born in Bermuda on October 22nd, 1975, to the late David Steed the first and Diane Steed and his sister Velva Scott. His first childhood years were spent living in Hillview, Warwick and then he moved to White's Island in Paget. He attended Bermuda Institute and went on to further his education at Oak Court University, graduating with a bachelor's in theology in the year 2000. He went on to Andrews University and obtained a Master's of Divinity in May 2005. He is presently working on his doctorate degree in ministry. He is the husband of Rochelle Wanda Steed and the father of David Steed the third and Summer Steed. His hobbies include golfing, table tennis, talking, more talking, and even more talking. His sister Velvet has told him and the whole world many of times that if they stayed at church or anywhere in the world at that matter, he would talk the whole night long. And she'll be still standing in the same spot to the next morning. After the, praise team sing, after the praise team sings, the next voice you'll hear is my great uncle preach his next pericope. Amen, church. Amen. amen. I just, I just want to thank God for covering me. Some, sometimes you think it's you, right? But it shouldn't be you. It should be God being seen through you. Yeah, and, and I just want to thank God that my neighbor accepted the invitation. So she's seen God, amen, because she definitely wouldn't be here <laughs> if she only came as a neighbor. But I just want to thank God 
for allowing her to come as well. Thank you so much.
Thank you, God, for taking our place. Amen, amen. The song says, his blood still works. If you didn't get it, we're talking about Calvary and him dying for our sins. Amen. I just want to invite my sister, my real sister, <laughs> uh, Sister Tracy Richardson, to come out and lead this song. Praise the Lord, everybody. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the Hallelujah. If you walk in the light and he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from our sins. How many of you know that the blood still works? How many of you know that the blood still works? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Testify, God is not dead, He is still alive. And the same blood that was shed way back on Calvary is the same blood that's working now for me. Oh, His blood redeems me from the stain of sin. And his blood cleanses me deep down within. So if you ask me how I made it and how I've overcome, I can tell you it's because of the blood.
Can the redeemed of the Lord shout hallelujah today? <laughs> the song said, it still works. <laughs> Come on now. It still works. 2,000 years later, it still works, man. The blood of Jesus still works for us today. If I had time, I'd go on a little bit long, but it's already late. Let us pray, Spirit of the living God, speak to our hearts. In the wee hours of this morning, you and I had a conversation about this moment. Speak now, Lord, for thy servant is listening. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Come on, somebody say amen again. Amen. Listen, I want to get to this as soon as I can. I don't want to keep you too long. It's time to, well, some of you are already ready to go get something to eat. But I lift up before you verse 13, if that's all right with you, of the eighth chapter. Verse 13 of the eighth chapter of the very last book in the Bible we refer to as Revelation. Revelation chapter 8 and uh, verse 13. Here's what the Bible says. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. I start again, and I beheld and I heard an angel through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, and woe. I have entitled this gripping, uh, this riveting, this eschatological pericope, like woe. <laughs> like woe. <laughs> it's an amazing thing because what we find in chapter 8 and even chapter 9 are seven trumpets that are to sound in these last days. But what are these blowing of the trumpets all about? It's very interesting because, if you would, the Bible lets us know that there are seven of them. And if you would, if we take a look in the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament reveal to us that the blowing of trumpets symbolizes the intervention of God in human history. Many reasons why a trumpet would blow in the Old Testament times. Sometimes in Old Testament times, they would blow the trumpet to summon everyone to battle. Sometimes they would blow the trumpet when they were giving or if it was the coronation of an Israelite king. Sometimes it was just to call the people together. And other times, uh, the warning of approaching danger. But in most cases in the Old Testament, the trumpets were used in the context of the temple liturgy and holy wars. It's very important that in essence, whenever the trumpeters began to play, that they gave the trumpet the correct sound. They couldn't give, if you would, when it was time to retreat, they couldn't play a tune that said it's time to go to battle. When it was time to go to battle, they couldn't say it was time to retreat. The truth of the matter is, they couldn't say it's coronation time, and then at the same time, be over here saying, hey, you know what? It's time for us just to come together. Every single time they blew the trumpet, it had to have a certain sound. And I need you to understand in these last days, God has called this remnant church of Bible prophecy to proclaim a specific message. It has a very specific sound. It has a certain sound and it must be delivered in these last days. It's important for us to realize when they would do this, they would have it for specific purposes. If you would, the Bible lets us know in Numbers chapter 10, the Bible lets us know, and the sons, in verse 8, and the sons of Aaron, the Bible says, the priests shall blow with the trumpets. This is the Bible. This is the Old Testament. They shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you an ordinance forever throughout your generation. Stay with me now. Verse 9, verse 9. The Bible then says, and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Let me pause here just for a second to let you know that the text says that when you go 
go to battle, you will blow your trumpets. When you blow your trumpets, God will remember you. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, that in essence, uh, he will hear your cry uh, and he will deliver you from the enemies. If I, can just, if I can just pause just for a moment and remind you about the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho. It's an incredible battle. And it's interesting because here we have seven trumpets. And you ought to understand uh, that when they were going to take Jericho, this impenetrable force, uh, if you would, walls so thick, not only did two chariots ride side by side on them, but in addition to that, there were many people that lived inside the walls. Uh, there were apartments, there were homes, there were condominiums inside of the walls. Uh, people had windows inside of them. This is how big and how thick and how impenetrable the walls of Jericho were. But God gives, if you would, uh, Joshua, one of the craziest battle plans ever. He says, I want you to march around the city uh, one time every day and then seven times on the seventh day. But here's who will lead the parade. I want seven priests uh, carrying seven trumpets. Uh, they will march around uh, the walls. Uh, and here's the thing. When you march seven times on the seventh day, here's how the battle will be won. I want you just to blow the trumpets. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place that in essence, uh, that when you blow the trumpets, uh, you call on God to do something. Uh, it makes God move uh, when he hears the trumpets. Uh, when God hears the trumpet sound, uh, he can't keep still. Uh, that's the noise uh, that says to him, it's time to go and deliver my people. Come on now. Verse 10, the Bible says in verse 10, I, I, I need you to understand also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginnings of your months ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings that they may be to you for a memorial before your God I am the Lord your God here what does he say what does he say that in essence you blew the trumpet when you needed me in battle what I need you to do is that after the battle is over and the victory has been won and you're celebrating and you're enjoying the fruits of everything I have done in heaven, what I need you to do is blow the trumpets again in appreciation and thankfulness for what I just did. I need you to understand you can't just call on God when you need him. You've got to say something about him when you don't. Oh, come on now. When he has just been God all by himself. You ought to celebrate just because he is who he is. Oh, I need you to understand that he's done enough in your life already, that you have a lifetime of praise. You can thank him not just for waking you up this morning, not just for keeping you on your way, but you can thank him that your children are still alive. You can thank him that in essence you're not in a hospital laid up right now. You can thank him uh, that the Eversleys made it back to church. Uh, you can thank him uh, that you made it through the marathon yesterday. You can thank him. Uh, why? Because uh, there's always a reason to give God praise. Uh, there's never a moment in your life, never a moment in your existence uh, where you don't have an excuse to give God praise. Uh, every now and then, uh, in the middle of Front Street, uh, you ought to just get to praise. And, uh, people think you're crazy. It's okay. You let them know that what God God has done for you has made you just a little strange uh, where every now and then uh, you can't uh, but think uh, of the goodness of Jesus uh, and all uh, he's done for you that you've got to say something uh, about the goodness and how he keeps on keeping you. Oh, does somebody know? Does somebody know that before the rain came, come on now, the tank was almost empty. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. Uh, some of you are sick and tired of buying water. And the truth is, this rain came in such a way that you're okay if it comes every other day because you need not to have to call for some $100, $130, dollars water truck to come and deliver you water. God provided your means this week for free that you can just praise him and thank him for he has been good to you. Oh, friends, it's an amazing thing because you can't just trumpet God when you need something. You ought to trumpet him every single day. If you wake up with breath in your body, you ought to get up and say, Lord, 
I'm getting up this morning, and I don't know what today will bring me, but what I know is that the same God that kept me last night will keep me as I walk through this day. Yay! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I'm not afraid of anything because God is my refuge and strength. He's my very present help in trouble. When I feel like giving up, he always shows up. When I'm ready to throw in the towel, he picks me up. I'm not afraid to face every single day because if God is for me, church, who, who, who says the owls from the trees, who can be against me? Some point in your life, you got to get to a place where nothing that happens to you throughout the day takes away your prayers. Oh, lose your job, come out the job, and say clearly, the Lord has a better job for me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. He's worthy to be praised. Oh, I wish somebody in here knew how good God is and knew that he's a way maker, that he is the doctor in the in the in the, in the surgery room. He's the lawyer in the courtroom. Whatever you need, uh, he just is. <laughs> Look on the continuum of time. God says, I am that I am. <laughs> I just am. <laughs> Huh? If you're in the future, I am. If you're in the past, I am. If you're in the present, I am. There is no place where I'm not working on your behalf, your salvation. So you need to get to a place where you trumpet God in the good seasons and in the bad. Oh, when there's food on the table and when the cupboards are empty, you've got to praise him anyhow because he is worthy of our praise. Oh, friends, I need you to understand that when the trumpets blew, God would respond by remembering his people, forgiving their sins, and delivering them from their vicious adversaries. Hold on a second now, if you will take me to this text, because I need you to understand what's going on in Revelation 8 and 9. There's a reason why these trumpets sound. To get that, we got to go to, if you would, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10. Let's read that together. Let's read that together. Revelation chapter 6, this is coming underneath the fifth seal. You remember we dealt with the seven seals. Under the fifth seal, there is a cry from the people of God. Listen to me. The people of God are being persecuted. The people of God are being oppressed. The people of God are dealing with all kinds of mess. And so in the midst of all of this, they cry unto God. That's what we're seeing here in chapter 6 and verse 10. Why don't we read that together? And they cry with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now I need you to understand, uh, there are some times in this life where people, even in God's house, get on your last nerve. Lord, help us. <laughs> there are some people in your life, oftentimes they are the closest to you, that get on your last nerve. I wish I had a witness in this place. <laughs> Don't look to the left or to the right. Just look at me. <laughs> they get on your last nerve. I'm saying they, they, they have this way of pressing buttons that cause you to think of things and think of words that you haven't said in a long time. <laughs> And it wells up within you. And you're ready to lose it. Because sometimes the people that you live with can give you the hardest time. Oh, Jesus. It's okay. It's okay. I'll talk about it. Uh, the truth of the matter is, never you get quiet, that tells me, go on. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. The truth of the matter is, sometimes the person you live with, uh, the truth is they know how to press your buttons better than anybody. They know what to say. <laughs> Oh, Lord, help us. They know what to say to send you clean off the roof. Uh, the truth is, is that they know what to say that turns you red. 
You know what I'm saying? That's for, that's for you light-skinned people. Turn you red. Lord, help us, man. Huh? And, 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 and they say things in such a way that, 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 in essence, they know that unless the Lord is controlling you himself, you're going to lose it. Huh? Huh, come on now. There's nobody. Come on. I'm, I'm trying to help some parents out here. Some parents that understand there's nobody that can drive you sometimes more insane than your own kids. One, one of the reasons why they tick you off so much is because you see your own devious ways inside of them. Lord help us. Uh, that, that in essence, in essence, in essence, there are some character traits that you have that you still haven't mastered, that you still have, that you passed on to them. And now you're ticked off because you wanted them to be better than you, but you've never gotten better yourself. Uh, you want them to be washed in the blood, but you've never been washed yourself. Uh, you want them to be fixed, uh, but you haven't fixed yourself. And the reason why you so easily identify what's going on with them is because the same mess is still inside of you. And it vex you that they got it. But if, if you want it to get out of them, you must first overcome it yourself, and then you'll be an example to them of how to get over it. Yeah. Truth of the matter is, God places children in your life to show you what's wrong with you sometimes. It's an amazing thing because the Bible says the people are getting oppressed. They're vexed, if you would. In the sense of they're really stressed out because the enemy is coming after them. And they cry unto the Lord saying, how long? How long must we wait for God to show up and deliver us from this mess? How long must our young people be dying in the streets? How long? How long do we have to put up with people pretending like they did us a favor because they sold us watermelons for $13.99? <laughs> How long must we pay these exaggerated prices? How long must we have to deal with the most expensive country in the world? You know, it's amazing because it's yeah, the most expensive place to live in the world, but it's not the most expensive place out there. Nope. I'm told in Scripture that there's a land that is fairer than day. <laughs> By faith, we can see it afar. It's amazing how heaven costs the most, but we get to live there for free. Oh, come on, somebody. It costs everything, but we get to go there for free. Oh, I want to let you know, man, that in essence, some of you are getting close to retirement in this house, and your retirement doesn't look good. Lord, help us. Oh, the truth is, is that you haven't saved up the way you should. You're scared to go into retirement. You're afraid to get pushed into retirement. You wonder how you're going to make it after all these years of working in retirement. I want to let you know that if there was ever a time to cling on to Jesus, that time is now. Because I'm told that if you would, you don't just get salvation. You don't just get the gospel. But I'm told that the retirement plan up in glory is out of this world. In essence, you get some free wings. Lord, help us, man. Come on now. You get free wings, a free crown. You get free clothes. You get free house. Come on now. When they pave the streets, they don't charge you taxes. I wish I had a witness in this place. They, they, don't, they don't look for the money to come from you because Jesus has already paid it all. And all to him we owe. I need you to get to a place that you understand that this is not our final home. Stop trying to enrich yourself down here and start laying up treasure in heaven uh, where nobody can mess with it, uh, where you can celebrate the goodness of God uh, when you get to understand. Uh, when you get to heaven, it will far exceed anything you've ever seen down here. Everybody's impressed with your nice cars, nice houses. That's great. Use them to bless others. Why? Because when the Lord comes, you're going to burn it all. You're going to burn it all. He will not have respect 
for your very expensive car. It will burn just like the little cheap Toyota you see outside. It's going to burn. The BMW will burn right next to it. It might burn faster. I don't know. But at the end of the day, it's all going to burn. The only thing you get to take from here to heaven is your character. That means that the thing you should be working on now is your character. Because when Jesus comes, that's all he wants. Everything else burns up. You proud of yourself because you got a nice house? Are you kidding me? You got you to repair the roof all the time. You got to fix leaks, fix windows. Come on now. Make sure the foundation's all right. Where we're going, the foundation is secure. It's built, if you would, of 12 different gems uh, that in essence, when we get there, there is no faults in the foundation up in Gloria. Everything is perfect when we get up there. Russian killing yourself for nonsense down here. The truth of the matter is, is that in essence, the saints are begging how long? And here's the thing. I love, if you would, as we kick off this, and this is going to be a few for this dislike woe, but I need you to understand that in chapter 8, verses 2, chapter 8, verse 2, it shows us equivocally that God hears our prayers. The Bible says, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Yeah? Hold on. And another angel came and stood at the altar, yeah, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he would offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Listen to me now. Come on now. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Come on now. And the angel took the censer, listen to it now, and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were what? Voices and thunderings and lightnings. And what, everybody? And an earthquake. Mm, take me if you would. To that next slide, if you would. Take me to a different slide because I needed to help us understand. Uh, for those of you that are visitors, this is, if you would, the tabernacle uh, or a replica of the tabernacle that God asked the Israelites to build for him as they made their journey from Egypt to the promised land. Okay, After they got to the promised land, they actually built one out of stone, you know, out of marble, out of gold. But, but while they were traveling, they were to build, if you would, him a tabernacle. So you guys are familiar, for those of you that are not, that in essence, every day, God would lead them with a, a cloud throughout the day and a pillar of fire by night. There's a pillar of cloud, almost looks like when they, when they give the depiction, I don't think anybody's actually seen it, but I like to make it look like it's, it's this kind of funnel-shaped cloud, whatever it was. It was a cloud by uh, the day to keep the sun from off of them, and then it was a pillar of fire by night because the wilderness is very cold, hence they need to be kept warm. Okay, however that manifested itself, it did. That same, if you would, cloud would turn into fire. The fire would turn into the cloud, and the cloud would turn into the fire every single day. It was an amazing thing because they moved as the cloud moved. Whenever the cloud started moving, they knew it was time to pack up and start moving. When the cloud stood still, it was time to stop. And when they stopped and set up their tents, they also built this, if you would, portable sanctuary in the wilderness. Now, understand this. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that particular thing, but just know this. There were priests that were designated to handle every single portion of this thing. So, so some of the guys, all they handled was the furniture. Some guys, all they handled was those, uh, those, those poles and, and the white you see around the outside. Some people only handled, if you would, the actual uh, sanctuary and, and, its, and its materials itself. Then the rest of them were handling those holy things as well. As you know, the priests would carry uh, the, the actual Ark of the Covenant. But I just want to take you inside, visitors. I want to take you inside that Ark right now. I just want to reveal to you what's going on in Revelation when it says that the prayers of God or the prayers of the saints ascend to God. The inside one or the furthest one away is the most holy place. In the holy place there were three pieces of furniture. To the left if you would you had the golden lampstand. If you would when you see Jesus 
if you would, in Revelation beginning. He's standing in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Uh, this represents the church that is supposed to be the light to the world. Uh, on the right was some bread. They had to put, bake fresh bread every day and put fresh bread on the altar. It's not sufficient. Oh, Lord, help us. I wish I had a witness in this place. It's not sufficient enough for you to try to live off of yesterday's bread. Lord Jesus. Uh, you're supposed to go and open up your Bible every single day and get fresh bread. You're not supposed to live off of yesterday's bread. Lord Jesus. Uh, some of you thought when you came into church, Lord help us, I, I need you to understand this because even when God gave them manna, if you try to keep the bread over for another day, in the next day it would stink of worms and maggots. Uh, some of you thought that when you walked into church today that that bad smell was, was a drunk that was sitting outside or it was somebody that was, if you would, hadn't had a bath yet, but actually uh, it was your carcass uh, coming in here with yesterday's bread uh, stinking of worms and maggots in God's house. Uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, it's not sufficient uh, for you to live off of yesterday's bread. Uh, God has an expedient word uh, to give to you today. You got to go get it, though. God does not deal with lazy Christians. You don't spend time in his word, you won't get it. He says, he that cometh to me must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek it. The more you go after him, the more he gives. Yeah, you want him, you want him all day? He says, here I am. <laughs> huh? You got some time off? Come spend it with me. I will fill you and fill you and fill you. Now, you got to be careful, though. Some of you spend so much time, <laughs> Lord Jesus, <laughs> some of you are, are so into the word uh, that you don't spend any time with humanity. <laughs> Lord Jesus, <laughs> You see, you're very heavenly minded, but you have no earthly good. And so in essence, there's a balance that must come about. In other words, you receive God's word so you can go and share it with somebody else. Okay? Don't get too full on it. All right? Because you get indigestion. You know what I'm saying? And what comes out is not good. When you get it, you give it. And then the more you give it, the more you get. And that's how it works. You've got to share with what God gives you. But take a look at this if you would. If you would, I want you to focus right there on the altar of incense. That's where the priest is standing. He's offering the altar of incense. Now I need you to understand very quickly as we're about to close that in essence this, that particular curtain, that particular curtain, they call it a veil. It separates, if you would, the priest from the most holy place. That veil, every single day, the people came and confessed their sins. The priest would take some blood. Yeah. He would walk it inside the holy place, and he would throw blood on that veil. And he would throw blood on the veil. He will throw blood on the veil. I don't know if some of you ever visited the cancer ward at the hospital, the, 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 the wards at the hospital that deal with a lot of blood. You can smell it as soon as you get off the elephant. You can smell the scent of blood. And here's the thing. For an entire year, they just threw blood on that veil which meant that the veil in and of itself stank. It was rank. It was disgusting because the blood on the veil represented the sins of the people. Here's the thing. God's presence is right on the other side of the veil. Lord Jesus. And so in essence, you need to understand that your sins stink in the presence of a holy God. That in essence, the veil is there, and it has all this nasty blood on it, and it stinks. And God, on the other side, if you would, would normally have to, spell, have to smell the stench of your sins. Here's the thing, though. The way the tabernacle is built, the incense, if you would, would go where the priest couldn't. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, see, the priest can't go beyond the veil. He has to stay on this side of the veil. Uh, he can't go on the other side. But above the veil, 
there's an opening. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. Uh, that in essence, when the priest uh, would light the incense, uh, the incense uh, would go above the veil uh, and fill the room uh, where God's presence was so that you didn't smell, he didn't smell your sins. Uh, all he smelt uh, was the sweet-smelling incense. Oh, hold on a second now. I need you to understand uh, that when you offer up your prayers uh, and you ask God to forgive you, uh, when you ask him to wash you clean, uh, your prayers go up uh, before God as sweet-smelling incense uh, to cover up the stench of your sins uh, so that God doesn't smell uh, the stench of your foolishness, uh, but he smells the sweet-smelling savor uh, of your confession. He says if we uh, confess our sins, uh, he is faithful uh, and just uh, to forgive our sins uh, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what God wants you to do. I need you to understand that that trumpets were blowing and they were, if you would, to bring the people to repentance and they were also a divine warning that time was running out. Oh, the blowing of the seven trumpets and the seven seals both bring to us the end of earth's history. The end of the Hebrew sacrifice system was heralded by the blowing of trumpets. I need you to understand that back then, the lamb was placed on the altar. The blood was poured out at the base. The assigned priest would bring the incense in. And when he had finished making the sacrifice, he would come out and bless the people. And when he came out to bless the people, guess what? Seven priests would blow their trumpets to let everybody know that the sacrifice had been accepted. Uh, I need you to understand uh, that 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave his life. Uh, and while he hung there on the cross, uh, you need to understand there was a thief on his left and there was a thief on his right. And these two thieves, one is cursing him out. One is telling him to curse, do something about this situation. The other thief, uh, the other thief, though says Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom if you would the other thief the good thief if you would if there's a such thing that's an oxymoron the good thief the good thief says remember me when you come into your kingdom if you would at that moment the good thief sounded the trumpet. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, and immediately, uh, when you sound the trumpet, uh, God has no choice uh, but to show up and deliver. Uh, he says today, uh, oh, I'm telling you right now uh, that you will be with me in paradise. Uh, I'm telling you right now that when the roll is cold up yonder, uh, you will be in that number. Oh, I need you to understand. The Bible says the Lord shall descend with a shout, uh, with the voice of the archangel, and with what? The trump of God. And the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. If you are in trouble today, the song says lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims. Be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Echo it, hilltops. Proclaim it, ye plains. Jesus is coming again. If you Lord Jesus is coming again. Heavings of earth tell the vast wandering throng Jesus is coming again. Tempest and whirlwinds and anthem prolong. Jesus is coming again. Nations are angry. By this we do know Jesus is coming again. Knowledge increases. Man run to and fro. Jesus is coming again. Uh, we must tell the world. Uh, we must lift up the trumpet. Uh, we must make it alive sound uh, that everybody man, woman, boy and child knows that our Savior is alive. Uh, he redeems. Uh, he is Lord. Uh, he is risen from the dead uh, and he is Lord and one day every knee will bow. Uh, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh blessed assurance uh, Jesus is mine. Uh, oh what a foretaste of glory divine. 
I'm an heir of salvation, been purchased by God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is your story. This is the choir's story. This is the world's story that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, today, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Somebody here needs to give Jesus their best. Somebody here has been in trouble for quite some time. Need God to move and to redeem them. Somebody here wants to sound a trumpet to heaven right now that they need deliverance from the mess that's in their life right now. Today, if you want to sound that trumpet, I invite you just to stand wherever you are, just everybody. You want to stand up and just say, Lord, I'm sounding the trumpet, and I want you to deliver me. I want you to sound the trumpet, and I want you to deliver me. If that's you, just sound the trumpet. Get up. Get up out of your seats. Sound the trumpet. Tell all of heaven that you need their deliverance. You need them to make a way for you wherever you are. Don't be afraid. Stand up. And then we always like to extend the opportunity. There's always some little ones and sometimes some big ones that want to give their hearts to Jesus Christ. They want him to be the Lord and Savior. They want to be baptized. I know my little ones always lead the way, but if you want to be baptized, little ones that are out there, we'll start with you. We'll start with you. I know some of you went saying and left, but if that's you, just raise your hand wherever you are. We have some little ones that want to be saved. You want to be baptized. You want to be a part. God bless you. You want to be a part of God's community of faith. Perhaps there are some adults that's here as well. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. We can sing the chorus of that song. I got to trust the way stay in the narrow way. That's what we're playing. I'll live my life clean every day. Come on, choir. Let's sing it together. I want to be, go with him when he comes back. There's somebody here that realizes with everything going on, things have gotten so serious that you need to come to Jesus. That you need to give him your all. You don't know who you are. But God knows exactly who you are. And today he wants to save you. You want to be in that next baptism, wherever you are, just invite you to come. I want to invite you to come. I want you to come. Come on, sing the choir song, sing the choir. God is, God is my all. Oh, sing it with from church. Just want to extend that invitation. I see the kids, I see the kids. Is there somebody else that wants to be in that number? Come on now, God is, yes. Let's sing that with them, church. God is joy and strength of my life. Come on now. All pain, misery, and strife. Promise to lead me, never to leave me. He's never ever come short of His word. That's whosoever will, let him come. Let him come. If it's you, just come. Just come. I want, I want, when he comes back, come too far, and I'll, I see your hand, I see your hand, come on, God, come on, sing the song, church. yes, Yes, he is. Yes, he is. God is. God is my own. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for the few that raised their hands today. I know there's somebody here, Lord that didn't make that decision, God, I pray that you'll keep them uncomfortable until 
they make things right with you. Perhaps they'll come and see us afterwards. Perhaps they'll send us a message tomorrow. But Lord, keep them uncomfortable. Keep them wrestling until they realize that there's no one on earth that can deliver them but you. Give them restless nights, sleepless nights until they realize that the God of heaven loves them more than life itself. He's the one that protects them. He's the one that keeps them. Show yourself to them in marked manner, we pray. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. Let's sing that together. God is, God is. Shall we gather at the river? my apologies. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of 
our God, Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to his riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. And now I will pray for the meal. Lord, we thank you for the spiritual meal that we have feasted on. Now bless the physical meal which has been prepared for the nourishing and strengthening of our bodies, that we may be fit vessels to do your bidding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Bless this house. Bless. Keep us strong. until wash it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. We give God the praise. We offer praise to God.
for your goodness to me, Lord. For your goodness, Lord, to me. For your goodness, Lord, and your mercy toward us.